Just how much does Hashem love Am Yisrael? Parashat Tzav talks to us about the korbanot, the korbanot, the sacrifices that we did at the time of Moshe Rabenu, the time of the Bet Hamikdash. But all of this ended with the destruction of the Bet Hamikdash after Am Yisrael sinned. We weren't allowed to do it anymore. But yet the sages teaches in the Gemara Masechet Megillah that everything we learn in the Torah, in the Tanakh, is relevant to every single one of us for all of the generations. So how could learning the details of the Korbanot be relevant to you, to me, to everybody that's learning it? How does that have anything to do with HaKadosh Baruch Hu's love for Am Yisrael? In fact, how is the secret answer to all of this is inside your Sidur. This and much, much more is going to be taught tonight. We're also going to address the issue that needed to be addressed about Noahides and Noahides organizations, the thoughts of sin being worse than the sin, the ways that Am Yisrael is supposed to deal with the Gentiles, the ways that Am Yisrael is supposed to simply do everything that they're doing, and much, much more. Countless questions, many Baruch Hashem answers, and most importantly, Lots of ways to be holy. Enjoy, share, support, and be holy. We're back here on our Wednesday night. Shiur Torah, Stump the Rabbi, where uh, after some Divrei Torah, you guys, Bezat Hashem, will ask some questions, and uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu, Bezat Hashem, will give us the answers. Uh, tonight's uh, shiur will be for the Refuah uh, Shlema for Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit uh, Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Avi Mori David Ben Nesriah, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and uh, also for the Refuah Shlema and Atzlachar of all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides that continue to support all the wonderful uh, distributions and uh, helping of the poor and all the other amazing things that our organization is doing, Baruch Hashem. Uh, as a um, reminder for you guys, we're only a few, do- a few days away uh, from Pesach. We still have an uh, extraordinary opportunity for everyone to be part of uh, the food distribution to the poor that we're helping in Eretz Yisrael. Unlike what the anti-Semites think, not all Jews are rich. Uh, there are many of them that are poor, so much so that uh, over a, uh, 1 million children in Eretz Yisrael go to sleep hungry each and every single day while the uh, stupid government over there of Zionists and atheists are, uh, you know, fighting over who's going to be in the papers more often than the other and uh, whose uh, uh, name is going to be more important on the list of, uh, of liars, uh, the reality is the people are suffering. You know, the inflation is uh, certainly not helping. Prices are higher than ever. Uh, but uh, aside from that, there's just simply a, uh, an unrest in the country that is uh, not helping the situation. And uh, many people are simply struggling. And especially in the uh, Frum communities and the uh, religious communities, although there are some wealthy people that are very, very well off, even billionaires in some cases, unfortunately there are many, countless, uh, that are very, very poor. And as I said, over a million children uh, are uh, going to sleep hungry. We're not talking about a million children like we have here in America, almost 400 million people. A million people is not a big deal. Uh, Percentage-wise, we're talking about nearly 10% of the country uh, are going to sleep hungry. So there's a lot of uh, poverty, a lot of difficulty uh, over there. And uh, one of the things that our organization, Bezat Hashem, does uh, throughout every holiday uh, of the year, whether it's a, uh, the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, Sukkot uh, period, or it's a uh, Purim, or it's Hanukkah, or it's a uh, Pesach. Uh, we're always distributing food, or well, sometimes uh, we're distributing money, or both, which is actually what we're doing uh, this year. But unlike all of the other times that we've done, uh, this time uh, we uh, we actually uh, also uh, combined it with a major Torah event where we got 500 Bachurim, 500. Uh, Torah scholars, each of them having, you know, has a family, some big families of 10 and 15 kids, and uh, some smaller families of 5 to 8 kids, which by American standards is still considered a big family. And uh, literally, so that's 500 families uh, that uh, learned the uh, Talmud Bavli in a single day. Uh, Baruch Hashem, we achieved it, and each one of them got uh, at least 500 shekels 
Uh, some of them got more, so that's almost uh, about 300,000 shekels was spent on that, about $100,000. And now we have about uh, another 100 uh, or so families, 150 families actually, uh, that uh, are getting help as we speak uh, for the holiday. Uh, some uh, are getting more than others because they have bigger families or bigger needs. Some are major situations, but usually these are families of either Torah scholars or uh, their families of widows and orphans, meaning people that simply don't have another opportunity uh, to, uh, to, make, uh, to make ends meet. They're doing everything that they can already. So, Baruch Hashem, uh, we're doing everything we can. We're hoping that uh, all of you that are enjoying all of our lectures and everything that we do for free throughout all of these years are going to uh, uh, help us with this. Uh, and for each uh, that does, Shem will bless you not only with the uh, chesed that you're doing by helping the poor, but also with the Torah that uh, they also studied uh, for the merit of all of those that helped them. Uh, so with that uh, being said, anyone that go wants to go to the uh, campaign website goes to uh, should go to bhpesach.org, bhpesach.org. That's the campaign uh, website. Uh, and uh, as any of you already uh, probably already know, if you're new to here, uh, then uh, one thing that's unique about our organization is that not only do we not take any money for ourselves uh, for any of these distributions, uh, like unfortunately most organizations do, but we actually add more, meaning whatever we end up getting from people, we usually add a lot more money to it to, because there's usually more demand uh, and, and help needed than, uh, than what, uh, you know, what we usually get from the public. But uh, regardless of that, this is certainly a uh, auspicious time to fulfill this mitzvah. This is part of the mitzvot of uh, Pesach. Uh, if you look at the Rambam, Rambam says that the uh, way that a person uh, enjoys the holiday is, uh, b uh, starts with helping the poor. Uh, so we have, Baruch Hashem, Parashat Tzav. Parashat Tzav is a uh, very interesting parasha uh, for those that study it and understand uh, a little bit of Torah. But for people that are new to Torah, uh, people that I've uh, learned from, you know, from people that uh, don't really know much, usually the uh, heretics and idolaters of, uh, of Christianity, uh, that uh, you know will confuse you when you read a parasha like this, and the reason why is because similar to last week's parasha, parashat Vayikra, this parasha tzav is about korbanot, about sacrificial offerings. Now, the uh, Torah is telling us about all of the different details of the sacrificial offerings of the korbanot, and uh, this was something that we did up until the destruction of the Bet Hamikdash. Once the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, we were no longer uh, permitted to make any sacrificial offerings, meaning you cannot take a cow or, or a goat or a sheep today and slaughter it as a sacrifice uh, to Hashem. This would actually, anyone that would do such a thing, it's actually a, uh, not only a sin, it's a din karit, meaning it's one of the uh, worst sins you can possibly make in this world. Uh, in the same caliber as desecrating Shabbat, in the same caliber as uh, saying Hashem's real name, uh, in the same caliber as adultery, uh, you know, in the same caliber as incest, uh, idolatry. This is what Din Karet is. And uh, anyone that goes wants to know the list of uh, uh, Karet sins goes to Masechet Kritut in the first daf, the, uh, page two. It gives you the 36 uh sins that are karet but the zohar kadosh says that there are actually 12 more meaning there's a total of 48 uh karet sins and the gemara in masechet makot page 13 uh, has a mishnah over there that gives you different uh uh sins that uh, get malkot that get whipping also and you see that some of them are actually also uh karet sins meaning that there are some karet sins that not only the person gets a uh, death penalty, uh, whether heavenly or by the uh, Sanhedrin at the time of the Sanhedrin, uh, but also they get a, uh, a whipping. They get a whipping, a 39 whips of, uh, you know, that they get. Uh, so uh, the point being is, is that these karet sins are, uh, you know, the as big deal as a big deal gets. So a person is not allowed today to take a uh, cow or any type of sacrifice and bring it to Hashem. 
Uh, yet at the same time, our sages teach us that in the Gemara and Masechet Megillah, that uh, everything that's written in the Torah, in the entire Tanakh, is, re- uh, is relevant to our world today, to our life today, to our personal lives, meaning it's relevant to me, it's relevant to you, it's relevant to any person that studies it, it's going to be relevant to them. So of course, I mean, individual verses are sometimes easier to pinpoint of how this is relevant to me or you, uh, but when you look at an entire parasha that talks about sacrifices at a time that we are forbidden to make sacrifices, uh, you, you know, initially a person could be easily confused that how could this be relevant to me if I'm not allowed to bring a sacrifice? And of course, the idol worshippers from Christianity, especially those that missionize, uh, you know, use this as a sort of a uh, argument against Judaism by saying, oh, see, since you Jews are not able uh, to bring sacrifices anymore, uh, then that's uh, obviously a proof that uh, Yoshke uh, uh, dying for you is the, uh, you know, their, uh, their man-god idol uh, uh, dying for you is the only way to go. Now, of course, this is a, a dumb argument, but the point being is, is that if somebody came to you, and today there's unfortunately a lot of missionaries roaming around Jewish communities, whether those Jewish communities are in Israel or they're in America or they're in England and Australia, the missionaries are everywhere. And uh, just uh, like some of my dear friends that are serious Talmidei Chachamim that fight against uh, the, uh, uh, the missionaries, they know that the n- number one defense against missionaries is Torah knowledge, meaning don't spend your time watching you know uh debates between rabbis uh, like uh, you know the the uh, dear rabbi uh, uh, tovia singer who is the best in the business against these missionaries in order to know how to deal with missionaries he himself will also tell you don't you know don't spend your time studying his debates in order to deal with missionaries why because the best defense against the missionaries is actually having Torah knowledge. And the reason why he does what he does for the last four decades is not in order to educate the Jewish people uh, uh, to, uh, to go and debate the Christians, but rather to uproot all of the Jews that have already fallen to the church uh, and bringing them back by showing them that they're mistaken in their current, uh, in their current ways. That's the whole point. So now, so when, if a Christian missionary knocks on your door, shows up to your office, or does any one of the sleazy things that they do, which is pretend to be a Jew in order to uh, go into the community, into the Jewish community, and then he tells you uh, the argument. Well, listen, uh, you know the uh, the Torah says that uh, you have to bring a sacrifice, and the Jewish people are not bringing a sacrifice. So you see, something has changed. What answer can you give them? What answer can you give them? The answer is actually in your prayer every single day. Every single day we read this as part of our prayer, as I've mentioned to you guys before. The Sidur is not something that uh, a bunch of smart people put together. The Sidur is something that prophets put together. Uh, The Anshei Knesset Agdola, uh, the the men of the Great Assembly, were comprised of the greatest men uh, of the time, which also included prophets. And uh, the uh, prayer, the Sidul, was based on the foundation of the teachings of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Avraham taught the secrets of the morning prayer. Yitzchak taught the secrets of the afternoon Mincha prayer. And Yaakov taught the secrets of the uh, uh, night prayer, which is the Ma'ariv, or the Arvit. But the Enshek Neset Agdola added more to it. They added more of Psalms and more oral Torah teachings in there in order to open up specific gates in heaven uh, that they knew we needed. And also in addition to that, in order to teach us on a regular basis different things that we're going to need at different times. One of them being the issues of Korbanot. Now in our morning prayer, in the Shachrit prayer, we have a section uh, that starts with Ribona Aolamim Atatsi Vitanu Lakriv Korbanat Tamid Bimoado. This is a section where we say to Hashem, Master of the World, you commanded us to offer a Korban Tamid, a continual offering uh, on time. Meaning, we're talking to Hashem here and saying, you are, You're the one that told us that we have to bring this specific sacrifice every single day. 
and yet we can't do it because the continued offering was cancelled at the uh, destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Ve'en lanu lo kohen ba'avodato, ve'lo levi beduchano, ve'lo Yisrael b'ma'amado. And we don't have a uh, kohen that's in his uh, service that can do it. We don't have a levi that's on his platform, and we don't have a Yisrael that's on the post. So how do we do this? As the prophet says, and the Sidu quotes the prophet Oshea, chapter 14, verse 3, And you said, yes, my dear sons, yes, of course you can continue to fulfill this mitzvah even without bringing the sacrificial offering. How? By doing exactly what they did at the time of the Bet HaMikdash. Unlike what most people think where it was just simply a meat factory, you just bring the sacrifice and you leave, there was a whole process. And a significant part of the process was the prayer itself. The prayer itself that a person does. This is the reason why we pray in the morning against the Kobanot that were done in the morning. This is why we pray in the afternoon against the Kobanot that were praying during the afternoon. And this is why we pray at night against the Kobanot that were done at night. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us through the Prophet Oshea, we, uh, may, we make up for the uh, bulls through our lips. Meaning that the instead of bringing the bulls as an offering our lips our prayers are going to be the sacrificial offering the gemara in masechet menachot page 110a says in the name of rabbi yochanan that a person that toils in torah person that learns torah studies torah supports talmidei chachamim it's as if he is building the Bet HaMikdash. Each time completes another Masechet. It's another stone on the Bet HaMikdash. Another line, another stone on the Bet HaMikdash. Another parasha, another stone on the Bet HaMikdash. The Torah is the, is, the, uh, is the purpose of this world. And his Talmid, Resh Lakish, Says in the same Gemara, "Kol ha'osek b'Torah ki ilu ikriv olam mincha chatat ve'asham." He says, "Even more so, even more so, anyone who toils in Torah supports Torah. This is as if he just brought a sacrifice of Ola, the uh, raised offering, which we'll discuss tonight, the mincha offering." which is the afternoon, the chatat offering, which is the sin offering, and the Hashem offering. Meaning that learning Torah is actually even more than the sacrificial offering process itself. So when, what type of Torah? Any Torah is good, but especially if you learn about the Torah of the Korbanot. Now, Am Yisrael sinned. We, the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the Bet HaMikdash, the first one was because of idolatry, murder, spilling of blood. The uh, Chachamim also say that there was also Chilul Shabbat, wasting seed, immorality. And the same concept goes with the second Bet HaMikdash, where even though many uh, pinpoint the Lashon Hara, the uh, baseless hatred, uh, uh you know that uh, is is expressed through lashon hara as one of the uh primary causes of the destruction of the bet mikdash the gemara uh, across the board in masechet shabbat sanhedrin and several other places says that that wasn't really the only sin there was also desecration out of shabbat and other uh, immorality that led to the uh destruction of the bet mikdash but the finer pillar the final thing that uh, that led to the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash wasn't those sins themselves, but rather what happened at the time of Jeremiah. What happened at the time of Jeremiah, which by the way we also say in our Siddur, in our prayer, is that Jeremiah the prophet knew that Am Yisrael is in trouble. Jeremiah knew that Am Yisrael was sinning. Jeremiah knew that Am Yisrael is on the verge of having their Bet HaMikdash destroyed and the people massacred. And he warned the people time and time again, and they wouldn't listen. But he did everything he possibly could. 
But then he saw that the decree was passed anyway in Shemaim. And he pleaded with Hashem. And Hashem said to Jeremiah, If you can find me a single rabbi, a single leader, aside from yourself, that is rebuking the people, I won't destroy it. Meaning if you can show me anyone other than yourself, any rabbi, any teacher, anyone out there that is telling people they need to do tshuva, telling people to stop wasting seed, telling people to stop des- desecrating Shabbat, telling people to stop with the avodah zarah on their head, telling people to stop cheating in business, telling people the truth. Show me one person, I won't destroy it. And Jeremiah went from place to place, from shul to shul, from yeshiva to yeshiva, from community to community, and he couldn't find. Hence the Gemara in Masechet Chayiga says, Anshe Emuna Avadu. Jeremiah says, men of truth are gone. No one wants to tell the truth. No one wants to tell people to do tshuva, and they don't realize what that means. That means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, didn't want to destroy the Bet Mikdash. Didn't want to hurt and kill his own children. But he had to, as that was the only choice in order to save them. Because if he would have allowed them to continue, they would have all assimilated with the Goim and eventually all become Goim. They would have destroyed the nation themselves with their own hands. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to use the stick in order to bring this horrific atrocious holocaust 2000 years ago in order to save his people why because because no one wanted to teach the truth no one wanted to tell people to do tshuva and it wasn't enough that jeremiah was doing it somebody else had to get involved the average person the average rabbi had to get involved and since they did it that was the decree the decree was finalized in Shemish Mo. and that's actually what we say every single day in our prayer Anshe Muna Avadu. Anshe Muna Avadu is not just people of truth, of, of faith, but rather, what faith? Faith enough to tell the truth. Go look at the Gemara Masechet Chayiga, uh, and uh, I believe it's uh, page uh, 14 uh, over there, talks about this verse. So, the key is that we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah, first hand witness. Of what happened before and after the destruction and that's also why we have to go to Jeremiah to really prove to us that what we said in regards to these sacrifices being replaced through our lips is true because he was there before he was there after he heard the decree but he also knew the reason for the decree meaning that the destruction was in order to save So we go to Jeremiah. Our dear Jeremiah in chapter 31 tells us one of the greatest secrets the world simply does not realize, including the Jewish world. In the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in the name of Am Yisrael, these statements are made. Chapter 31, verse 19. Boshti begam nichlamti here in the name of a Kadosh Baruch Hu and Am Yisrael, having a conversation, if you will, where Am Yisrael is saying, I was ashamed and I was also humiliated, for I bore the disgrace of my youth. Meaning, Am Yisrael is saying, Ay, 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 yeah, now that we see. What happened here? Destruction of the Bet Mikdash. We can't bring sacrifices. We're further from Hashem. What, what's what's going to be with us? Look at what we did. Hashem didn't do this for no reason. He didn't humiliate us for no reason. This disgrace was because of the sins that we made going against Hashem. This, these sins are what brought the public disgrace to the nation. How much better it would have been, says the Ma'ari Kara in the name of Am Yisrael, how much better it would have been had the people 
heeded to the pleadings and the warnings of Jeremiah and the prophets and done tshuva before God found it necessary to punish them. The Abarbanel says that whenever someone matures and conducts himself properly, people will accept him, will be charitable to him, and they're not going to hold back the sins that he made when he was younger. But if a person continues to sin, then everyone is going to hate this person. Why? Because they're going to know that really he's evil. So Am Yisrael is embarrassed because they know they're not looking to sin. They're not looking to go against God. It's just the Yetzara interferes. The Yetzara convinces them to go against and they're embarrassed now that they got punished. HaKadosh Baruch Hu speaks to them back and he says, Is Ephraim my favorite son or a delightful child? That whenever I speak of him, I remember him more and more. And therefore my inner self yearns for him. I will surely take pity on him, the word of Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to his dear son, Ephraim, which is referring to Am Yisrael. Ephraim is another name for Am Yisrael. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Am Yisrael, I see that you're looking to do tshuva. I see that you're looking to, to, to correct your ways, to give you some chizuk, to keep going. I want to tell you this. You're agonizing about not having the Bet HaMikdash, not being able to make sacrifices, being publicly disgraced by idol worshippers that saying, oh, look at you, you can't make sacrifices anymore like you used to. You know what? Are you just a my favorite son? Are you, are you just a delightful child or are you my favorite son? Meaning, are you just one of the creations that is out there? Or are you my favorite son? To tell you the truth, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you're my favorite son. You're my favorite son. That whenever I speak of you, I remember you more and more. Meaning that anytime I mention you, I keep thinking about you and loving you more and more. And the sages teach us in the Midrash Rabbah, what is this Dabri? What is this Dabri Bozacho? That whenever I speak of him, I remember him more and more. It says that any time that you learn Torah. That earns a Kadosh Baruch Hu's compassion. So much so that a Kadosh Baruch Hu says that my inner self yearns for you. That the relationship between you and I, my dear favorite son, is so deep that any time I remember you, I yearn for you, I love you so much, that I simply can't control myself and I'm surprised at how much I love you. The al Shikha Kadosh, who in his shiurim, he would have such attendance as the Arizal, Rabbi Yosef Karo, Rabbi Shlomo al Kabetz, they were the attendants to his shiur. So you understand who's talking here. Da'al Shikha Kadosh says on this verse, a Kadosh Baruch Hu says in this verse, I'm surprised at myself at how much I love you. You know what that means? I'm surprised at myself at how much I love you now. Now that you did tshuva. Why I'm surprised that I love you so much after you did tshuva? Because I love you now that you're doing tshuva even more than I loved you before you made the sin. In so many words, the fact that you made a sin, it wasn't good, but now that you did tshuva, it actually made me love you even more than I loved you before. That's how much a Kadosh Baruch Hu loves Am Yisrael. That's how deep the love is between a Kadosh Baruch Hu and Am Yisrael. So to earn even more of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's extraordinary love, we're going to learn a little bit about his korbanot. The korbanot and fulfill the mitzvah as if we're bringing a sacrifice as we speak right now. 
But not just one sacrifice, but literally all of them, as Rish Lakish says. So the parasha, parasha Tzav, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe Rabbeinu the clear instructions of each one of these korbanot. The korban Ola, in chapter 6, Parashat Vayikra, uh, in the Sefer Vayikra, Parashat Tzav, Hashem speaks, speaks to Moshe, saying, Speak with Aaron and with his sons, saying, This is the laws of the Chatat. In the place of the Ola is slaughtered, shall the Chatat be slaughtered. It is holy of holies. So, the f- one thing we learn here in regards to the Korban. Is like Kadosh Baruch who says, you see how you did the Korban, all the details that I taught you about the Korban Ola? Don't just think the lesson ends there. There is a lesson about the mechanics of how the Torah itself works in that Korban. What is it? I'm telling you to bring the Korban Ola also there in order to teach you that all of the rules that applied to the previous korban apply to this and from there the chachamim learn in masechet kritut you uh, have all of the different issues of karet and so on but many of the details you see that you're learning this the same thing but it's all based on one how so that there are 13 hermeneutic principles of understanding the Torah. And the eighth one of these principles, these are in essence the rules. Like if you look at a map, for example, there's a key. The key is going to tell you the measurements, how to measure the distance between one place and another. You can't just say, oh, no, this looks close because it's this big no you have to obviously when you look at a map you have to know what where the key is that's more important than the map itself is the key same concept when you look at any type of uh, a thing that you have to decipher you have to know what is the rules to understanding these uh, uh this particular equation so our Torah has 13 hermeneutic principles the eighth one says, That if anything was included in a general statement, but then singled out from the general statement in order to teach something, it was not singled out to teach only about itself, but rather to apply the teaching to the entire generality. In so many words, the Torah is actually teaching us that if, let's say, for example, like in Masechet Makot here that I'm looking at, it has a list of sins that there is whipping for. But some of those sins are karet sins. So the question is, wait, do you apply the the, the makot to uh, the karet sins also? Is it just death penalty? What do you do do with this? And then you see that the Torah itself, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 29, talks about forbidden unions, immorality. And it gives a list of all of the immorality crimes. And it says that for whoever commits any of these abominations, homosexuality, incest, you know, adultery, all these filthy crimes, anyone that commits any of these abominations, the one who did it will be cut off from the midst of their people. Meaning, karet. But then later on, in chapter 20, verse 17 of Leviticus, it says, a man who takes his sister shall be cut off. Meaning if a man decides he wants to marry his sister, 
It's against the Torah. He's going to be cut off. So, but you already said that it's cut off. Why are you mentioning it twice? So the eighth principle of the 13 hermeneutic principles says that the reason why that one mitzvah or prohibition, if you will, is mentioned again is in order to teach you that that applies to all of them. That applies to all of them. That particular lesson applies to all of them. There was a lesson in regards to makot, whether there's whipping or not, that was excluded on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the incest. And that, what you would learn on that one, applies to all of them because it was under the same list of abominable acts, forbidden acts, but then it was excluded. So the eighth, the eighth principle says... It was excluded not to make you uh, think that there's only a rule that applies to that, but rather the opposite. It was excluded to show you that the rule that applies to it applies to the rest. So here we see that in our Torah, in our parasha, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us this rule. says, what you did with the Ola shall be done to the Chatat. Why? You're putting it in the same place. The next thing we learn is a little Musa. A little Musa. A little Chidush. Baruch Hashem. Chapter 7, verse 21. It says that an earthenware vessel in which it will be cooked shall be broken, but if it will be cooked in a copper vessel, it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. This is part of the sacrificial offering that use different vessels, either to carry the uh, the blood that was sprinkled over there, or to put the meat in the different uh, parts of the animal that's being sacrificed. So Hakadosh Baruch Hu says, if you used a earthenware, like a clay vessel to hold the pieces of meat that you're about to sacrifice, it has to be broken after you finish the sacrifice. And if it was a metal one, you could just purge it, meaning you have to put it into boiling water, then cold water, that's like that's called agala, which is what people do uh, now in for, for preparation of Pesach, if they want to use the same uh, pots and pans, uh, they have to either use agala or libun, which is fire. But the uh, point is that in order to kosher it again, you have to do agala. Now, why is there a difference between the clay pot and the uh, metal pot? Because the Chachamim teach us that once the meat was determined to be a sacrifice. That means that that meat is forbidden for anything else. It's forbidden for anything else, meaning it has to follow the procedure of the sacrifice. If the sacrifice is supposed to be completely consumed as the sacrifice, completely burned, no one's allowed to eat it. If part of it is supposed to be burned, part of it eaten by the Kohen, his family, and so on, no problem. That's what has to happen. If it has to happen, uh, you know, like the uh, uh, Korban Toda, it has to be done that night. You have to eat it that night. You can't save for the next day. Anything that's saved for the next day has to be burned. So that means that that Korban is that way. Each Korban has its own rules. But the key is to understand is that once that meat touches any other food, the Mishnah in uh, uh, Masechet Psachim, in uh, chapter uh, 4, Mishnah 4, chapter uh, uh, Dalet, Mishnah Dalet, says that any food that touches a korban that's holy, becomes holy. You have to apply the same rules to that korban, to, to that food, as you do to that korban. So for example, you have a piece of meat, you're going to make it determined to be a sacrifice. And accidentally, your challah touched it. The challah touched it. That challah 
has to be, uh, you have to uh, uh, treat it as if it's a part of the korban, meaning the rules, that if you have to eat or burn that korban that night, you have to do the same thing with that, you have to consume that challah that night. Anything that is left beyond that night is called notar. Notar is leftovers which must be burned. So here the uh, Torah is telling us that if this meat was put into a vessel that's earthenware, that uh, the taste, the, uh, the juices, if you will, of that meat are absorbed by the earthenware. And therefore, even if you consume or burn all of that meat, there's still going to be some remaining juices and taste inside the walls of the earthenware. Now, since the Torah says that you're not allowed to consume that korban past the time, whether it's that one day or two days, depending on the, uh, on the korban, but once it's over, once the time slot is over, you're not allowed to consume it anymore, that means that that vessel also becomes forbidden. And therefore, there's no, since there's no way to kosher the earthenware, you have to destroy it. You have to break it. On the other hand, with the, uh, with the metal, since the metal does not absorb the, uh, 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 in the same fashion as the, uh, uh, as the earthenware, where the pores of the metal, they open and close, meaning that if you take whatever it absorbed in the food that you cooked in it or the sacrifice that's in it, if you put that vessel, you put that pot inside boiling water, it reopens the uh, pores and releases all of the taste that's in it. And it's the reason why you're allowed to take your pot that you used all year for chametz food, boil that pot, and now you're allowed to use it for Pesach. Now, of course, that boiling process should be done by a professional, someone that knows all of the halachot, and not just by you at home if you don't know all the details. Because many times people will say, oh, no, it's hot water. No, hot water is not enough. It has to be boiling. That's also the reason why a person that does agala wears a big glove. It's a uh, it's a big deal. Because if it's hot, it's not going to open the pores the same way. Point being here is that we see that there are two types of vessels that are used. Where's the musar in this? Aside from the brilliance of the Torah, the musar is this. We see that in the world there are two types of people. Akadosh Baruch Hu says in the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin in Perek Chelek that before Mashiach comes, everyone is going to get a chance. If you do tshuva, good. If not, he's bringing Haman. And Haman's going to make you do tshuva. Meaning, if Am Yisrael does tshuva, good. They'll be able to welcome the Mashiach with open hands, with open arms. Doesn't do tshuva, he's bringing Hitler. And Hitler is going to make you do tshuva. So now, there are two types of people. One person, that's an earthenware. One person, that's a metal. The person that's metal, he hears this. He hears about, if I don't do tshuva, if I don't do tshuva, if I don't do tshuva, oh, yeah, yeah, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me? Haman, he's going to come after me if I don't do tshuva. That's enough. You already put some heat on him. You put him in some hot water. He's scared. Enough. I'm doing tshuva. Enough. I'm doing tshuva. I promise Hashem I'm going to keep Shabbat. I'm going to protect my breath. I'm going to protect my eyes. I'm going to give staka. I'm going to learn Torah. Enough. Okay, you put some heat on me. I'm done. Whatever I did in the past, chatanu avinu pashanu. I'm sorry, Kadosh Baruch Hu, I'm going to change. He's like a piece of metal. He's a piece of metal. You put a little heat on him, he's going to change his ways. But some people, what can we do? What can we do that some people are not like a metal? Some people are like the earthenware. They hear this. Say, ah, no, come on. Come on. Nah, that already happened. World War II. Hitler already came. That's enough. He died already. Oh, you don't think there's more Hitlers on the way? You don't think that Iran wants to be Hitler? You don't think that all types of other countries that sometimes pretend to be our allies don't want to be Hitler? You don't think that the leadership... In Israel itself right now, these lefty liberal Zionists don't want to be Hitler. They showed they were best friends with Hitler at the time of the Holocaust. Not best friends in a sense of they were going golfing together, but they did the same thing. 
just like the uh, uh, the Nazis in Machshimam killed Jews, the Zionists had opportunities. They also did the same thing. Some they killed, some they sold to to have experiments done on them. Oh, we can go to town on all the different things that they've done to Am Israel. The point being is, some people hear this and say, "No, it's not going to happen. Come on, now we have." The, uh, the, the Iron Dome, it's going to protect us. We have America as our ally. We have money. We have technology. We're, we're even better than uh, Silicon Valley. We have smart people. We have good soldiers. You have delusion. You have no clue what kind of risk you're in. That's what you have. You have no clue what kind of risk you're in. And some people, unfortunately have become self-hating Jews. They hate that they're Jewish. It's the craziest thing in the world. They hate that they're Jewish. They hate Jews more than the Nazis. They hate Jews more than Amalek. They don't understand what gift they have. They were chosen as one of the chosen people, but they hate themselves. Sometimes these people are Erev Rav. They're, they're actually Amalek themselves. And sometimes they're just simply clueless, poor you know, victims of, of, of society and what happened out there. So you go and you have an obligation to rebuke, to help, to teach. And sometimes those people right away say, oh, wow, I'm, I have to keep me taught. They do it. But sometimes, nah, come on. I don't want to do it. I like my sins. I like my this. Why is it Kadosh Buhu says, ah, the heat that I put on you is not enough. Oh, you want to be an earthenware? Okay. Then I'll break you. And that's what happens, Rabbi Karim. And unfortunately, a very large number of people that end up doing tshuva only end up doing tshuva after HaKadosh Baruch Hu breaks them, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes away their money, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes away their health, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes away their family, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes away their peace of mind, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes their reputation, takes their career, takes different things that they hold dear, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu breaks them, then they say, Oh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, will you help me? Where were you the last 30 years? Where were you the last 40 years? Oh, I didn't think, I didn't think. Ah, you forced me to break you. Okay, fine. Yalla, come on. Why? I love you. HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't want to break you. He didn't want to cause you all types of horrible things, the cancer and the, the, the other diseases and the financial crisis and the divorce and the hardship. He didn't want to do all of that. But there was no other way to get you to do tshuva until you became desperate and broken, just like the clay. Had you been like the metal vessel that a little bit of heat, a little bit of truth, a little bit of recognition that anti-Semitism is on the rise, a little bit of realization that your life is on the line every single minute. Had you been like that, you would have done tshuva, Hashem would have not, wouldn't have actually had to put you in the situation where you had to break you. But since you weren't, you had to break you. You had to break you. And don't worry. Broken will happen to everyone who doesn't do tshuva. So we see from here, Rabotai Karim, that a Kadosh Baruch Hu loves us so much that even if he has to break us, he's going to do it for the sake of that love. Why? Every time I think of you, I love you even more. Because the second that you do tshuva, I love you even more than had you not done tshuva. Next lesson we learn about the korbanot, the sacrifices. The korban todah. The thanksgiving offering, not thanksgiving that happens in the Gregorian calendar of the goyim of uh, uh, November, but thanksgiving that happened every single day. That's why Jews don't celebrate thanksgiving. Why? We're obligated to say thanksgiving to Hashem every day. Every day. Not just once a year. And we had a sacrifice called the Thanksgiving offering. Koban Todah. Now what about how do we apply this Koban Todah today? This Koban Todah was done every day. But there was conditions. 
What was the condition? You could be the one that brings the Koban if you met these conditions. The conditions were, one, you survived a life-threatening crisis, almost got into an uh, accident of some kind, or got into an accident but didn't get hurt, like our dear Rav Chaim Kachlon, Rav Ephraim's father, almost 40 years ago, got into a car accident, fell asleep on the wheel, got into a car accident, his car flipped multiple times in the air. The car completely crushed to nothing. When the people came, they realized they had to call, they had to cut the car open to see who survived. And as they're cutting, he's standing over there. I said, sir, you have to move out of the way. He goes, no, no, I, I, I was in that car. I said, what do you mean you were in that car? The car is crushed. The, the, the person died. He goes, no, no, no. I was the, I was the person in that car. How? There's not even a scratch on you. Now at that time, he wasn't keeping Torah and Mitzvot yet. But after that car crash, he says, You're not going to regret saving me. You're not going to regret saving me. And for the last 40 years, he dedicated his life to Torah, to Mitzvot, building a family full of Kedusha. So a person that has a life risk, has to bring a koban. Or a person that just came out of jail. He was in prison. Has to bring koban to that. Serious illness is another, you know, it's similar to risk. Someone that was sick for three days was bedridden. Has to bring koban to that. Someone went to a sea voyage. Had to bring Koban Toda. Another example of a uh, dangerous uh, trip is like going to the desert. Koban Toda. How does this Koban Toda apply today? We have Birkata Gumil. Anyone that had any of these conditions, they were in a hospital, they were sick, bedridden for three days, they were on a, uh, a dangerous trip. A uh, life risk of some kind, any of these conditions has to go to shul and tell the rabbi, Rabbi, I need to do Birkata Gomel. Birkata Gomel means you have to, uh, usually it's done when we read the Torah. So typically it's done on uh, Shabbat, but it can be done at any time during the week. You say a uh, uh, the, the, the blessing of uh, 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 thanking Hashem for saving your life. And you have to have at least a minyan of people that say Amen. So this Koban is fulfilled today. Every day. Every day somebody says Koban Toda. Every day somebody says Birkata Gomel. Now interestingly enough, this Koban is different than the rest of the Kobanot. Why? Because the Torah says you have to bring also different loaves of bread and biscuits or wafers and f- all these different types of bread, 40 loaves of bread. Now, we're not talking about 40 little lachmaniot, little uh, little buns. We're talking about 40 pieces of huge bread. 40 of them. With this koban, with this sacrifice. How long do you have to eat all of this? You have to take four of them and sacrifice them. But the rest of it you have to consume. How long? That night. You don't even have two days. That night you have to eat all of it. Why is Hashem shortening this uh, time for me? And if anything, he added to so much bread, this meat. He said, who's going to eat all of this? Exactly the point. Because you have an obligation to consume all of that, that night, you don't have that much time, it forces the person that had this miracle to invite everybody. Why? Why does Hashem want you to invite everybody, have this party to invite everybody? To publicize Akadosh Baruch Hu's miracles. To publicize Akadosh Baruch Hu's miracles. Oh, why, why? What's happened? Why am I here? Why is this? Wow, 40 pieces of bread. Oh, Ishtabach Shimon. Look at that Korban. Look at that meat. Look at all these people. What, what, what's going on? Oh, you didn't hear? Hashem saved his life. Oh, how? And all of a sudden, you start hearing all the wonderful things that Akadosh Baruch Hu did for the host of the party. Every day this happened. 
Imagine that. Every day you have a shiur Torah of what? Miracles. Hashem took back his millions, the movie, every day. Imagine that. Hashem saved me I was in the desert. The lion almost killed me. The, the uh, snake almost killed me. There, Hashem saved me. Hashem saved me. Wow. Next day. Oh, you don't understand. There was a bunch of Arabs. They were throwing rocks. They were throwing this. They were throwing that. Hashem saved me. Wow. Next day. What happened? Oh, a bunch of Nazis. They were trying to attack. They were saying this. Hashem saved me. Wow. Oh, what happened? Oh, I was sick. I almost died. But Hashem saved me. How? Miracle. Hashem, every day Hashem saved me. Imagine that. Imagine every single day there's an event to show how a Kadosh Baruch Hu saved this person. Imagine. Every day somebody got saved. Every day. This Ishtabach Shimola, it's not just once. So it can happen multiple times every day. Korban Toda. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu structured it in such a way that you have to invite a bunch of people. They have to eat this bread, they have to eat this meat all one night. After this night, all becomes forbidden. So, to force us to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. Why is it important to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name? The Gemara in Masechet Chagiga, I believe it's a Daf Dalet, Amud Aleph, says that if you did not sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name today, there was really no reason for you to be born. If you didn't sanctify a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name, you didn't make it, you didn't publicize a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name today, there's no point for you to be born. Why? That's what you were born for, to sanctify Hashem's name. People get excited, oh, yeah, I can do this particular mitzvah next week, and then I can do Kiddush Hashem. No, no, you're not understanding. Yeah, it's good, go do that mitzvah next week to go do a Kiddush Hashem, but really, you're supposed to do it every day. Every day you have to find a way to do Kiddush Hashem. Every day. One of the best ways that a person can do Kiddush Hashem, learn Torah, teach Torah, to help other people do Tshuva. Right? That's the greatest Kiddush Hashem in the world. You can tell stories, but how many stories are you going to tell about miracles? You have to tell stories to different people every day. But to help people do Tshuva, you share the shiur, you share this shiur, you share a different clip from our uh, a different channel to help people do Tshuva. These are ways to do, to sanctify Hashem's name while you're publicizing His name. And the Gemara says, if you publicize Hashem's name, good. If not, there's no purpose for you to be alive. Because you're not fulfilling your purpose. So although it's good to be excited for a big Kiddush Hashem event next week and next month and next year, don't think that absolves you from the responsibility of doing it every day. Every day we need to do it. Or at the very least, try to do it. So, we see that this Korban Toda, it says, Im ala toda yekrivenu toda. That if he brings it as a Toda, he shall offer with the Feast of Toda offering. But it says, instead of saying with the Toda, with the sacrifice, it says on the sacrifice. And the Chachamim teach us that the reason why Hashem uses this specific word of Al and it's a, uh, instead of Im is as the Ramban uh, explains it is that on top of this sacrifice there are other things that a person can do. In addition to it, in addition to the sacrifice, you also have to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. Next, we see the last point about these precious korbanot. And then we go to questions. The Torah says 
that if a person that's impure has tumah, tumat keri, tumat met, all types of tumah. He touched somebody that was impure, dead person. Uh, he has tumah of keri where he wasted seed, uh, or even if you know uh, the uh, intimacy between him and his spouse. This type of stuff creates tumah. He has to purify himself before touching the korban. If he doesn't, if he's impure and he touches the korban, that's a sin. He ruins the korban. That's karet sin. That's a karet sin. Or if he is pure and he decides to touch a korban that somebody else ruined, that's also a big sin. Why? He became impure now. You can't just impurify yourself just because. And Torah says that if a person pays attention to the details, he realizes that these korbanot are a big deal. So much so that if he eats a korban while being impure, he has Din Karit. He's eliminated from his people, as the verse says in chapter 7, verse 25. He's eliminated from the people. He's cut off from the people. Now, when we're praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Chachamim teach us that we have to have focus on the prayer itself because a prayer that you don't care about that's robotic that you don't pay any attention to is like a body without a soul but even more so the Kobanot tell us since these prayers whether it's Mincha, Arvit, Shachrit Whatever prayer you're doing, reading Tehilim, crying to Hashem, whatever it is, since these prayers are your sacrifice offering, you now have an additional reason to try harder, to do it right. Because had it been at the time of the Beit HaMikdash and you brought a Korban without the right intentions, where... The rules of the Koban is for you to consume it in one day. But you already thought to yourself, no, I'm not going to do it today. You know what? I'm going to do it tomorrow. Automatically, just from that thought, without you saying it, just from that thought, since Hashem knows your mind, knows what you're thinking, that Koban becomes forbidden. It's called Pigul. Hashem knows what's in your mind. If a person says, no, come, come to the Shiur Torah. Come to pray. We should work on ourselves to want to do it. Now, of course, it's not so easy because we have a Yetzirah. But we need to push ourselves to do it. Why? Because if we're already going to be in this world, and we're going to need a Kadosh Baruch Hu to help us be in this world, we have to bring Korbanot. We have to bring sacrifices. The sacrifices are our prayers. The f- sacrifices are our learning Torah. The sacrifices are a servitude of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So if we're already going to serve Him, let's serve Him right. Let's at least try as hard as we can. So at the very least, once we do it, it's not considered a pigul. It's not considered bad. If we're praying or we see somebody else praying, let's focus. You see somebody else praying? Don't bother them. Don't walk in front of them. Don't call their attention. Don't try to talk to them. Let them pray. They're bringing a sacrifice to Hashem. Don't ruin their korban. It's din karet. Don't put your and their life on the line because you want some attention. It can wait. Let them finish praying. If you're going to go learn Torah, don't play with your phone while you're learning Torah. Don't look elsewhere while you're learning Torah. Focus on the Torah. Why? It's, you're bringing a korban to Hashem. You're bringing a korban to Hashem. Don't ruin it. You're bringing a korban to Hashem. If we take all of this stuff, and even if we divide it into four, and we apply a quarter of that four to our life, already change your life. Already it changed 
your prayer. It changed, you were learning to what? It changed the way you perceive korbanot forever. And that's in essence one of the purposes of Parashat Tzav. To change our perspective once again about how extraordinary and amazing our holy Torah is. So while the idol worshippers think that we don't bring sacrifices, the reality is we bring sacrifices every single day. But some of us need to bring those sacrifices with a little bit more zealousness, a little bit more focus, a little bit more kavana. So this little bit of heat that you got from the shul, Bezat Hashem, it can help. Some people, the shoe is not going to be enough for them. Why? They still don't want to pray. They still don't want to learn Torah. They still don't want to do what they're supposed to do. So Torah says, Ah, you want to be clay? You want to be the earthenware? You're going to force Hashem to break you. Not because He hates you, but because He loves you. Don't cause Hashem to break you. It hurts. I know from personal experience. It hurts a lot. It's smarter to just be receptive. Be a good boy. Be a good girl. Do what Hashem says. Be modest. Keep Shabbat. Eat kosher. Much easier life. Seems harder, but it's much easier. Better marriage. Better kids. Better finances. More blessing. You have vacation once a week. It's called Shabbat. You have another vacation for a full month out of the year. It's the holidays. Every month is holidays. You're part of something significant. You have a purpose. Lots of stuff. Plus, watch my shield Torah every week. So with that being said, Baruch Hashem, hopefully this is the, 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 the fire for those people that need the fire and those that need breaking. Bezot Hashem. This will convince him to not go that far and not force him to break them. But at least if he does, they won't lose hope because they'll know exactly why he did it. So, with that being said, I'm going to get a quick drink and then you guys can start asking questions. Let's see. Questions, questions, I'm waiting for the questions. I watched a video on YouTube that says that God wants Jews to be vegetarian in the start. No, it's fake. It's not true. God does not want us to be vegetarians. And there are endless proofs of that. Number one, the Gemara in Masechet Moet Katan talks about how the uh, way to fulfill uh, gladness, you have to be glad during the uh, holidays and during Shabbat, is by eating meat and drinking wine. Uh, secondly, we have a uh, endless amount of laws when it comes to slaughtering meat in order for it to be kosher. So if Hashem wanted us to, uh, to be uh, vegetarians or vegans, why would He have all of these uh, laws for us to eat kosher meat? Number three, in the Torah itself, Hashem says that there are, uh, you know, we're unlike the nations that are allowed to eat uh, you know, all meat and, you know, all animals that they want, all fish that they want, all birds that they want, uh, just as long as they're, as they're dead, the Jewish people have to uh, not only eat the animal only after it's dead, but uh, and if it's slaughtered, but also only specific animals. If it's a uh, uh, animal like, uh, you know, um, uh, then it has to have two signs. It has to chew its cud and has to have split hooves so something like the bull you know the cow the uh, uh they have split hooves the uh, uh sheep uh goats uh deer these are animals that have split hooves and chew their cud there are four animals the torah says that have only one sign and the rest of the animals don't have any signs at all Meaning that a Kadosh Baruch Hu already told us in the Torah exactly how many animals we're allowed to eat. Uh, and in fact, that uh, you know, these animals are the animals that are the most uh, common animals out there. So there's uh, plenty to eat. 
Uh, it's not uh, rare animals. He's not telling us that we have to eat lions or we have to eat uh, a uh, coyotes. No, he's telling us that we could eat cattle that are, uh, you know, very uh, domiciled animals. They're animals that are very calm. So when a person consumes them, he doesn't consume the bad nature of the animal. This is also, by the way, one of the reasons why the, uh, the Jews that are Torah observant, uh, that follow the Torah, why they are merciful people and they're very, very, uh, uh, typically very calm people. And, uh, you know, uh, they're generally uh, a, a very kind people because the nature uh, of the whatever you consume goes, you know, becomes your blood. On the other hand, you see that the uh, people that don't eat kosher, whether they are Jews that don't eat kosher or it's Gentiles that don't eat, uh, that, you know, eat all types of animals, Many times they eat animals that are not only not kosher, but they're, uh, this, you know, they're bad animals. They're nasty animals. Like, for example, the uh, most despicable animal is the pig. The pig has the most uh, despicable nature of all animals. It's uh, one of the animals that has one sign. So it pretends to be kosher because it has only one sign, but it's still not kosher because it's one out of the two. But it is the most disgusting, vile animal out there. Uh, to such an extent that uh, it eats everything. Anything you throw at the pig, it'll eat. Diapers it'll eat with the, uh, uh, you know, whatever fillings you have in there, uh, bad food, uh, anything, anything. People, it'll eat anything. The, the, the pig is a disgusting animal. And also, it's the, uh, it doesn't sweat. That means that all of the toxins, the poison that's in the body that usually leaves through the pores, uh, of both people and animals, the the uh, pig is the one animal that doesn't have that. He doesn't have sweat glands. So all of the poison, all the toxins stay in his body to such an extent that, uh, and you can double check this on Google if you'd like, you double check it, uh, it's so poisonous that the skin of the pig is uh is literally uh, even a venomous snake can't do anything to him like if a snake bites a pig with all the venom nothing happens to him this is actually part of the reason why they sometimes they throw uh venomous snakes that they catch to the pig to eat them because the the, the, the snake can't do anything to the pig that's how poisonous the uh the the pig is but unfortunately uh, many times people, uh, you know, uh, that uh, are, uh, don't keep kosher, uh, eat pig, and they don't realize not only are they eating something that is literally poisonous, but it's also an animal with a bad nature. And you will see uh, this yourself, that the people that eat pig the most often, they're usually the ones that have the worst nature, worst character traits. They're uh, typically very nasty people. Uh, not just behavior-wise, but just a, uh, as far as like their uh, the way they communicate, but just the traits how they uh, carry themselves. So uh, certainly, uh, uh, the the nature of the animals that a person consumes, you know, becomes them. Be, you are what you eat is literally what it is because everything you eat becomes your blood. So anyone that told you that uh, Hashem wants us to be vegetarian is simply clueless. Uh, heretic uh, because there are specific animals that we're supposed to eat because that is a, a part of the what's called tikkun olam tikkun olam next don't I think eating meat is wrong uh, well if you believe that you are created for the animals rather than the animals were created for you uh, then not only are you uh, not allowed to eat, you're not allowed to do a lot of things. You know, the, 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 the vegan type of mentality that pretends to have mercy, we're saying that, oh, I don't want to eat meat because I feel bad for the cow or I feel bad for, uh, you know, the uh, whatever other animal out there. That's why I don't want to eat it. That's pretending to be merciful. Why is it pretending to be merciful? Because... Even if you don't eat the meat, you're still consuming the animals. How? You wear shoes, you wear belts, you have perfume, you have soap, uh, you have a, uh, literally, th there is no end to the amount of, uh, uh, of animals 
that are used for everything in your life. It is impossible for anyone that lives in the world today not to consume animals. You have any type of uh, 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 product in your life, you have a hairbrush, uh, you have a, uh, uh, literally anything, anything that you have typically has something that comes from the animals. So now you don't think that they go to the animal and they say, oh, um, hi, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Little Piggy, Mr. Uh, Cow, Mr. Uh, uh, whatever animal, can we borrow your uh, sweat glands so we can make a, uh, a uh, DKNY uh, uh, perfume? Can we, can we borrow some of your sweat? We'll wait over here. When you finish, let us know when you're ready to die so we can kill you and make, make uh, perfume out of you. Just let us know. Oh, uh, hi, uh, Mr. Um, alligator. Yeah. Uh, how, you, how you doing? You having a good time? Yeah, yeah. What? How many kids you have? Oh, three kids. Wow. Married. How long are you married? Five years. Psh, wow. Well, listen, we need some belts. We need some belts. So uh, let us know when you're ready for us to cut you up. Let us know when you're ready for us to slaughter you and we can make some belts. Okay? You're just like, we're going to wait on the side. When you're ready, when you're ready for us to make some belts and also some shoes. We need some shoes. You know, some people like shoes. They like the, you know, they like that leather. <laughs> they like that leather, buddy. Yeah, yeah, that's you, that's you. It's all you. We'll wait for you over here on the side. We're going to wait for you. What world do people live in? Do they think they're not consuming animals just because you don't eat them? Just literally, just look right, look left, look up, look down. Your whole house is full of animals. Worse than a zoo. So spare me the mercy of I don't want to eat animals because I feel bad for them because you're consuming animals anyway. That's number one. Number two, animals were created for man. That's how Hashem created the world. Hence the reason why he told us that we are allowed to consume the animals. Before he gave us the Torah, he told Noah that he's allowed to eat all of the animals. Any animal he wanted, just as long as it was dead. Eat whatever you want. After we got the Torah, we were, we separate, Hashem separated a certain segment of the animals, that these are the animals that we're allowed to eat as Jews. The rest of the animals or any of the animals, the non-Jews are allowed to eat them so long as they're dead. They have more leniency, if you will, to eat whatever they want as long as it's dead. We not only have to slaughter them, meaning kill them in a certain merciful way, where they don't suffer. So anyone that wants to learn a little bit about that, watch my uh, film on my uh, uh, YouTube channel called Torah, Science, and Wisdom of the Sages. And it talks about all types of things of literally proving how the, uh, uh, the Torah is proven by science. And one of them is actually how the slaughtering, the Jewish slaughtering of animals is the most merciful way to kill an animal. Simply because... The way that the slaughterer works, slaughtering the uh, animals, the animals that we're allowed to slaughter have to have two signs that are external signs. External signs of having chewing their cud and split hooves. But the internal sign that it has is that it has a single uh, vein over here connecting their brain to the rest of their body. While the rest of the animals in the world, the horse, the... the uh, 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 lions, whatever animals out there have multiple veins from their brain to the rest of their uh, uh, rest of their body, which means that when the Jewish slaughterer, the rabbi, slaughters the uh, the cow, that means he is once he cuts that one vein, he has cut all circulation, all blood flow that goes to the brain. Which means that by the time the blood, the message arrives at the brain that the that the neck was cut the animal is already dead literally happens within milliseconds whereas in the the other animals out there even if you slaughter them there's no way to kill them in a merciful way why because you're if you're cutting multiple uh, uh veins it's by the time you cut the first one well, the time you cut the first one, the message went through completely by the second one. So we see here that Hashem chose specifically these animals, the cow, the, uh, the, uh, the goats, the um, uh, um, sheep, and so on, deer, all these animals that not only have external signs of chewing their cud and uh, having split hooves, 
but also an internal sign that makes the killing more merciful. So he's allowing us not only to eat, but he's also teaching us how to be merciful and not be vicious animals in the process of eating, but still proving the point that the animal was created for our purpose, for our needs. If we need the animal for eating, or we need the animal for shoes, or we need the animal to uh, make a bed or a blanket or anything else that we need, that is what the animal was created for. This world was not a world that was created for animals. So a person has to understand that if they are uh, uh, of the belief that uh, the animals need the same treatment as human beings, that type of mentality is heretical and is against God and is in essence saying that you are more merciful than the God that created you. And that's simply not possible. It's not possible. And it simply puts a, a person in a dilemma every single second because on one hand you're saying don't kill the animals to eat them because it's wrong but on the other hand you're killing them also you're just not eating them you're killing them for your belt you're killing them for your shoes you're killing them for different uh, 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 products that you're using in your home there's no way to avoid killing them why because you need them they were created for you that's how Hashem put it in the world and uh, that's uh, uh, an important thing to understand last but not least just because uh, we are allowed to uh, consume them doesn't mean that we are allowed to torture them. That's forbidden. In fact, if you are going to uh, 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 slaughter an animal, as I just explained, it has to be done in the most merciful way. Uh, and uh, aside from that, if you're going to raise an animal, uh, such as a dog or a cat or any other type of animal that depends on you feeding it, then you have to know the Torah laws pertaining to that, which one of them being is that if you want to eat you have to feed the animal first because it depends on you uh you're not allowed to be uh vicious to animals so again while we are fully acknowledging the fact that we have a need and a mitzvah to eat animals this that are specific this does not coincide with the uh, with the idea of being vicious to animals because that's a torah prohibition eating animals does not equate to being vicious to animals like people think it's not, it's not the same. Why? Because the animal needs you to eat it. Now, you're going to ask, why would an animal need me to eat it? Why would the cow need me to eat it? And this is, again, referring to Jewish people uh, eating kosher meat because there's something called a tikkun. And each animal is uh, likely to have a soul in it of somebody that lived here before, made certain sins, and had to reincarnate as an animal. And part of its tikkun Part of it elevating itself to being back to being a human again is actually the consumption. So by you eating an animal, you're actually helping that soul that's in that animal elevate itself to be something greater than what it is. So again, there is a merciful God that created all of it. And if he said it's allowed, that means that not only is that the best thing for us to do, but it's actually the most merciful thing for us to do. And there are many, many other things, but I believe four different points are enough to uh, you know, show you that this is the right way to go. And hopefully it, uh, it's something that uh, opens up some people's minds to understand that this is what needs to happen. Next. I have a question about heaven. What is it supposed to be like? Um, well, heaven is one of these unique subjects in the Torah that is not discussed often and with as many details as Gehenom. Why is that the case? Because in order for a person to truly understand the pleasures of heaven, they have to understand the pleasures of being a righteous person, which means that they have to learn Torah and do mitzvot and serve Hashem and, and, and feel both the physical and spiritual connection to Hashem in order to understand 
what pleasure really is that's not dependent on some material and not dependent on somebody else and, and, and all, all types of physicality. So when a person that's not really aware, the average person out there is not really aware of the pleasure that you get from serving Hashem, and you're and is told details of what happens in heaven, they're not going to understand it, and in fact, they're not going to view it as a good thing. So one of the things that the sages teaches about heaven is that that's a place where you'll see all of the holy sages learning Torah, learning Torah in different yeshivot of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, of Moshe Rabbeinu, of Avraham, Yitzchak Yaakov, the yeshiva of Hashem, and you see all of these holy people studying Torah, Torah that's above and beyond anything that the world we live in uh, has, uh, and uh, enjoying the Shechina, enjoying the, uh, uh, the, f- the feeling of connection to the Shechina, connection to Hashem. Uh, literally feeling the love of Hashem. So this, maybe in a fairy tale, uh, may sound uh, good to some people, but to most people, they can't connect to it. Why? Because they have no concept of what this means. They have no concept of what this means. So that's why the sages didn't spend a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, ink on giving you the details of heaven, because if you are uh, if you are going to go to heaven, meaning that you're learning Torah, you're doing mitzvah, you're doing all the things that are supposed to do, you're already going to feel certain things that's going to make you more uh, uh, understanding of what I just said. And you're not going to need anymore because you're already going to feel certain pleasures of heaven even in this world. On the other hand, there are an endless amount of sources that explain the punishments of Gehenom, Kafakela, Chibuta Kever, different places that are designated for punishment now i have a movie that we recently published uh, about Gehenom. highly recommended to, uh, to anybody to watch just go to our uh, youtube channel you uh, or the uh, our uh, website or simply go to uh you know a, uh, the google and just type Gehenom, and you'll see the the movie come up uh and uh this film it's almost three hours and it gives you over 170 sources from the Torah uh, that discuss Gehenom, but this is from the five books of Moses, from the prophets, from the writings, from the Gemara, from the Zohar, from the Mishnah, from Hasidut, literally across the, the, the globe of the Torah. Uh, but these are only 172 sources. There are literally thousands upon thousands of sources that discuss Gehenom in detail. The chambers, the judges, the, uh, the, the horrible punishments for specific crimes, and all that is discussed, or some of it is discussed in the film. Why are there so much details to punishment in Gehenom, Kafakela, and, and Chibuta Kever, these three different places of punishment, uh, whereas for, for joy uh, you know, of heaven is very little. Why is that the case? Because even the most ignorant person in the world knows what punishment feels like knows what pain feels like. Why? That's life. The Mesilat Yesharim, uh, the Ramchal, wrote a, a book called Mesilat Yesharim about 300 years ago. And in there he tells you the majority of life is suffering. Meaning life in this world, you didn't come to this world to enjoy yourself. You came to this world to serve Hashem. You came to this world to work. That's what you came to this world to work. Adam la'amal yulad. And the prophet Job says, a person was born to toil. That's what you were born to this world. Now, the, the suffering that a person gets actually is up to them. They can bring the, uh, the burden on themselves by ignoring God, and therefore Hashem will bring them all types of suffering in this world, problems with money, problems with marriage, problems with kids, problems with health, uh, problems, uh, you know, uh, paying the bills, problems everywhere. That's one form of suffering that a person can get. Or a person can learn Torah. And when you learn Torah, learning Torah is difficult. I don't mean just learning Torah by watching my shiur. There's even more. There's obviously learning from the books themselves. And toiling and, and, and sitting there and, and, and literally uh, uh, going into the depths of the Torah, it's difficult. But that difficulty of either learning Torah or doing specific mitzvot to help other people do Torah, that replaces... The suffering that a person was supposed to get. So a person has to choose their suffering. Either they suffer from the burdens of the world or they suffer from the burdens of Torah. And that's what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the Mishnah in Perkei Avot 
that a person that takes upon themselves the burden of Torah, a Kadosh Baruch Hu takes away from him the burdens of the ways of the world. But either way, there are burdens, there are difficulties. And everyone out there, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, young or old, uh, you know, knowledgeable about Torah or not, are understanding any time that I say suffering, immediately everybody has a picture in their head of what suffering is. Some people to them, suffering is losing money. Some people to them, suffering is losing their car keys. Some people suffering to them is uh, a loved one dying. Some people suffering to them is a loved one not calling them and simply not caring that they, uh, you know, what they're doing. You know, your wife or your husband, you know, didn't call you all day. Person can be very sad because of that. Some people suffering to them is that they uh, gained weight. Some people suffering to them is that the food that they're eating is not good. They don't like it. Different people. Some people suffering to them is being in debt. You know, people ha literally have a trauma from being in debt. And so long they're in debt, literally they can't enjoy happiness. They can't enjoy even things that are good. So there are suffer different forms of suffering. And of course, there's the obvious suffering of actual physical pain that comes from diseases, from cancer, from AIDS, from uh, uh, all types of tumors and uh, viruses and so on. And uh, suffering comes in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes suffering, the worst type of suffering that a person has is the suffering that a loved one has. Meaning that while they themselves are perfectly fine, but a person that they love is suffering endlessly from some type of disease or, 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 or emotional uh, problem. And to them, it's even worse than their own suffering. This is usually the uh, parents that uh, see their kids, Chaz Shalom, suffer. To them, it's worse than they themselves suffering. So the point being is, is that when a person uh, is a, uh, uh, hears about the suffering of Gehenom, of Kafakela, of Chibuta Kevel, they immediately understand what is being discussed here and immediately, if they're normal, they become scared of going to these places that are that were created and designated only for suffering. They're only for suffering. Now, once a person hears that, this place is designated for suffering, the first thing they want to know is, okay, how do I avoid going there? You tell them, if you don't waste seed, you're not going to go there. If you don't violate Shabbat, you won't go there. If you don't commit immorality of any kind, adultery, incest, uh, uh, a uh, promiscuity, uh, you know, uh, immorality out of marriage, all of these different things, homosexuality, all of the LGBTQB stuff, all that stuff, you don't do any of that stuff, you're not going to go there. You're not going to go there. But if you do, you're definitely going there. No questions asked. Every single LGBTQB is going to gain home, or actually, in fact, going to go to Kafakela. Every single one, without an exception, unless they do tshuva. Every single person that is desecrating Shabbat, going to Gainon and never coming out, unless they do tshuva. Every single person that cheats in business, every single person is going to Gainon. Every single person that committed sins is going to Gainon unless they do tshuva. So a person that understands what that means, immediately says, you know what? I got to get my... I got to get my act together. I have to do tshuva. I don't want to go to this horrible place of suffering. Forget about heaven right now. Place of joy. That's not really my concern. My concern is not going to this Gehenna. And that's what Rabbi Israel Misalant taught nearly 200 years ago, is that if people truly understood the level of punishment that is in the lowest level, meaning the minor level of Gehenna, just the first one, not the worst level, just the minor one. If they understood the fire that's there, immediately they would cry and beg Hashem that they will do anything He wants, all of the mitzvot, they don't even want a reward for it. All they want is just not to go there. That's it. That's how a person that understands suffering and has knowledge of what suffering is, behaves. That's why it's not as important to know about the details of heaven. Now, the beautiful thing is, is that once a person learns Torah and lives a life of mitzvot, they start feeling the feeling of heaven. Where one minute, they could be not learning Torah and feeling like they're dying. 
literally feeling like they're dying, feeling sick, not being able to stand, not being able to, to function, not being able to use a computer. And then they gather whatever little strength they have and they start learning Torah. And after a period of time that could be anywhere from 15 minutes to two or three hours or four hours, they would stand whatever test and have difficulty in suffering. Eventually, once they pass that test, literally they feel as if they're experiencing a small piece of heaven. Yeah, but just, just a little while ago, you felt like you were going to die. Just a little while ago, you looked at your phone, you were contemplating whether to call the ER to pick you up because you didn't think you're going to survive. Now you feel like you're in heaven? How? That's Torah. That's Torah. So a person that understands the, the benefits of Torah can feel heaven if they work for it. And doesn't need any more details about what happens in heaven beyond, even though there are details. It's just that, again, it's not as necessary. The biggest part is to avoid Gehenom because that's the part that everyone can relate to. Okay, next question. So far, good questions, guys. I see the same questions again. Uh, what's the view of LGBTQB? Uh, the view is just like the Torah. The Torah says that uh, it's an abomination and those uh, people will go to Gano. It's considered disgusting in the eyes of Hashem. Suffering to you is that you can't waste seed. Well, in the beginning it's suffering because you're doing tshuva. Eventually it's going to bring you the greatest pleasure in this world because you're going to feel healthier, smarter, and you're actually going to be more wealthy. So... Mark my words when I say that, and you'll see. Give it some time, you'll see exactly what I'm saying come true. Not because I said it, but because that's what Torah says. What's the point of the uh, peot? My peot? So we have a mitzvah in the Torah, a Kadosh Baruch who says not to shave this part of your uh, head. Jews are forbidden from having the uh, haircuts that shave the sides completely like uh you know where the, the the hair itself is so short that you can't even fold it so that's usually a uh, less than a two a number two on a buzzer is forbidden for jews on the sides on top on top you know some people go bald or whatever but uh you know that's uh, not a problem but as far as the uh the sides we're not allowed to shave it less than a two um and specifically this this part over here this part over here now, there is a custom among Jews, uh, all the way dating back even to the time of Mordechai, which is Megillat Esther. It says that uh, the first time the word Jew appears in the entire Tanakh is uh, Mordechai, Mordechai in Megillat Esther. And the reason why he was called Mordechai the Jew, uh, the Ben Ishchai says, uh, about 200 years ago he writes this, that Mordechai had very, very long and big peot. So why do we have these peot? Now, our obligation is simply not to shave this part of our head because that was a uh, haircut of the uh, idol worshippers at the time. They would shave their heads on the sides and leave the uh, hair in the middle. Uh, this is called akafat rosh. It's completely forbidden for Jews. Uh, and needless to say, anyone that wants to convert also is not allowed to have these types of haircuts where they shave the sides and leave the top. That's forbidden. Uh, and people should have, you know, what used to be normal uh, haircuts. Now, some people want to do more than what the obligation is, which is to show Hashem that we love His mitzvot. So what we do is not only will we not cut this part of our head, uh, of our hair, but we're actually even going to grow it longer to show Hashem that we love His mitzvot. So we do extra. So for example, if a person wanted to show his wife that he loves her, now, he could easily say, hey, honey, I love you. And his wife could say, hey, honey, I love you too. Oh, okay, great. Nice. But if he really wants to show her that he loves her, he's going to do more than just say, I love you. Maybe I'll buy her a present. Maybe more than just a present. 
Or perhaps he'll do what Rav Tzion Abba Shaul did in front of all of his students. Rav Tzion Abba Shaul was one of the greatest Chachamim of his time. This is just literally uh, 30 years ago. He was the Chavruta of Rav Avadya growing up and uh, he also and throughout all of his life. And he was also the uh, head of Porat Yosef Yeshiva. So Rav Tzion Abba Shaul uh was a uh giant chacham wrote sefer and uh you know, he's uh, somebody that was a genius beyond comprehension but he loved loved his students loved them dearly and although he didn't have a break uh like other yeshivot where they have a time called benazmanim where they everyone is sent back home to to go relax they didn't have that he had a different type of vacation where every time they finished a Masechet in the Gemara, a tractate in the Gemara, he would take them on a trip to Tveria, Tiberias, and sit over there and relax. It was an ocean, you know, that was uh, secluded just for a uh, uh, site for men, site for women. And he would take him to different places and specifically to uh, rest in the ocean. And sometimes, the, you know, the, uh, there was one time one of the uh, kids said, listen, Rabbi, I want to go and... Uh, visit one of the uh, pray at one of the grave sites of the tzaddikim of the righteous people that's around here he said no no if you want to pray and learn go back home to the yeshiva we're here for a vacation this is our time to relax a little bit so he really took it serious to take a vacation i actually even have a picture uh of him being on the uh, on the ocean he went to visit one of his talmidim in netanya and his student to- took him to uh, an ocean in uh in netanya again secluded and, and modest and everything i'll even show it on the screen tomorrow when it's on youtube the point being is, is that uh, in one of these trips, Rav Tzion Abba Shaul taught all of his students, talk about hundreds of kids, taught all of his students and anyone that's ever going to listen to this story, a whole sure about loving your wife and what it is to show love. Now, of course, people do all types of silly things. They, you know, they pretend like they love their wife by buying them a lot of things. But in reality, they're, they could be cheating and lying to them and being nasty to them. But here we have one of the most one of the biggest rabbis in the world he's married for decades one of these times his wife the rabbinit wants to join him on this trip to tveria with his students so they go on a separate uh vehicle and the students go in a separate vehicle on a bus now as they uh once they get off the uh, bus they're in a uh, area where there's uh you know there's mountains in israel there's mountains every year and uh Everyone is enjoying the beautiful scene. Israel is a very, very beautiful place. Tveria is uh, certainly an exceptional place, extraordinary place. And uh, as they're looking up the mountains and they're looking at the uh, coastline, they're looking at everything beautiful, the Rabbanit stares at something. And the Rav notices that his wife is staring at something. He says, Rabbanit, what are you looking at? He says, oh no, look at that beautiful plant over there. As soon as she said beautiful plant now think about this literally a bunch of people all of the students are there the rabbinite says look at that beautiful plant it's on top of the mountain the rav he's already older he's not like a 20 year old man move take move out of the way move out of the way move out of the way moves all the students out of the way and he starts running up the mountain the mountain is full of thorns full of spikes full of everything he's running up the mountain no one understands what's going on here what happened why is the rabbi running up the mountain then as he's going through all these thorns and everything else through the bushes he gets to the top over there gets to that plant uproots this plant that's two three feet big and comes down the mountain he goes he go rabbanit you thought it was beautiful he goes a present for you he go what was it? It was a cactus. Cactus tree. He's carrying with his hands. Why? For the Rabbanit. All of those students that saw this finally understood what real love is. That's what real love is. Meaning, it's not just about buying something for somebody. And it's not just about saying something to somebody. It's having enough care for somebody that the moment you have an opportunity to give them to any type of happiness you run after it like you're running after a treasure so the beautiful thing is when you have a holy torah that teaches you things like this 
you realize this is a one stop uh, uh, source, meaning everything you could ever want to know is in here. Everything you could ever want to know is in here. And that's the beautiful part of the Torah. That's the beautiful part of the Torah. Everything you could possibly want is in it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, the, uh, to finish the point of why I said all this, as far as what does it connect to the peot, is that when we want to show Hashem that we love Him, we want to show Hashem we love Him more than just saying I love you, more than just, uh, you know, empty words. So we grow the peot. Now, there's no obligation to grow these peot. There's no obligation. But it's certainly showing Hashem, it's an expression of love, if you're growing it for the right reason. If you're growing it to look religious, or you're growing it to uh, impress people, then it's obviously the wrong reason to grow it. But if you're growing it as an expression of love for Hashem, certainly it's a good thing. Actually, no, I just remind me of another story. I'll tell you a good story. People like stories. I like stories. The few hundred years ago, there was a constant animosity and war between the Arabs and the uh, Christians. And the uh, both would have uh, their different parts of, you know, mercenaries or armies uh, traveling from, from place to place, murdering each other. And the position of power switched back and forth between the Arabs and the Christians. And unfortunately, the Jews that lived among them always suffered the most. Anyway, there was a time where the, uh, uh, the Arabs were, uh, you know, were not in the uh, favorable position. And uh, they went from, you know, from place to place, went from place to place, initially hiding, and eventually they gathered enough strength and they started attacking the, uh, the Christians. And any time they would see these Christians, they would literally murder them, they would kill them. The Ben Ishchai says there was one time where this uh, group of Arabs went into a uh, town and found all of these a uh, all of these Christians in there. They lined them all up, one after another, one after another, one after another, and uh, they killed them. Now. A little while later, the opposite happened, where the Christians went into an Arab town and killed them. Now, in one of these places, where the Christian actually went into the, uh, the group of Christians went into a, uh, uh, an Arab town, they uh, didn't realize that among these Arabs were some Jews. And one of them was a Yemenite Jew. So this Christian and his army, you know, they destroyed everything. They killed everybody, the wives, the kids, every, you know, they took, they took, they would take everything everywhere. And in this case, they lined everybody up and they would confirm if they're, uh, what they are. Problem is everyone, you know, looked the same. You know, they were all in the Middle East. They'll have these turbans on. They'll have the same clothes on. So they're all lined up and it would confirm if this guy is a, uh, from Islam or not. Anyway, among these people, there was a Jew. And this Jew tried to get the attention of the people, of the uh, Christians. He goes, please, please, I'm not, I'm not Muslim. I'm a Jew. And the Christian, uh, you know, commander over there looks at him and goes, what? Prove you're a Jew. Now, he can't show him his Brit Milah because the Arabs also have Brit Milah. They also have circumcision. So it's not going to help. Can't show him his clothing because they have the same clothing. Covering the head, they cover the head. So what did the Jew do to prove that he's a Jew? They look the same even. Jews look similar to, to Arabs. Even though most of the anti-Semites think that only Ashkenazim are, are, are Jews... This is further, you know, as far, far from the truth as exists. I mean, it's, it's literally uh, Jews of all colors and shapes and sizes. But anyway, uh, this Jew has to prove that he's Jewish. What does he do? 
he takes away from the back of his ears and he says to him look look I am a Jew and these are my witnesses these are my witnesses because Arabs don't have these peyot the Christian uh, commander over there liked this he liked that how, how he distinguished himself from because he knew that the Arabs don't have peyot they don't have this they may have a brit milah or circumcision that they do they may have uh, similar clothing they may even have similar features but peyot they don't have they don't have so this Jew says hey I'm a Yehud I'm a Yehud this is my this is my proof these are my witnesses these are my two witnesses and he called his peyot witnesses the Christian liked it and he says okay I like okay you're a Jew and he tells one of his soldiers he says, yeah put uh, put some uh, put some of the uh, uh, gold uh, bracelets gold uh, bracelets on this uh, give it to his witnesses so they bring a couple of brace gold bracelets to uh, to give to this Jew and uh, the Jew says to the Christian he goes you know my witnesses they're very strong they're very strong they can hold more if you want they can hold more the the, the Christian like they go okay go fill them all up fill them all up they literally filled up his payout full of gold and this Sadiq went and well Hashem not only survived the uh the massacre uh but also as a kiddush Hashem that this payout saved his life so this is a story from the Ben Ishchai. so this is one of the ways that HaKadosh Baruch Hu shows us what Shlomo HaMelech says Birzot Hashem ish gam oivav that when Hashem is happy with a person even his enemies will come and uh and uh say I'm sorry to him and and uh uh befriend him so here you know the Christians weren't exactly uh friends of the Jews for the last 2000 years but in this particular story it's one of the few exceptions where you see literally a Jew being saved from the sword of a Christian because of his Judaism and his expression of his Judaism in the highest extent so this too is going to be something that we're going to see in messianic times of the ship it's interesting how Israeli Jews are so fluent in English well that's because uh the people of Israel they learn languages in school and in America I know that the most common second language that people learn is Spanish some people learn uh, other languages I remember in school I learned uh, uh, Italian Japanese uh, but uh, generally everybody studied Spanish here in America in Israel everybody studies English so the average Israeli speaks English uh, some obviously better than others but uh, some speak English no different than uh, you and I now as far as myself I mean I, even though I was born in Israel uh, I've been uh, you know I've been I left Israel when I was 10 so I've been here you know three decades over three decades so English uh, is uh, has become my first language even though I speak Hebrew also because I've, I've lived here for much longer but uh, as far as people of Israel they speak English because that's what they teach in school okay Let's see Okay, uh, let's see some questions from. Let's see some questions from Facebook. Uh, okay, let's see. Does one need to know, do a gala on the kitchen counter if they will cover the counter on Pesach? The, uh, the the custom of the Ashkenazim is much more uh, stringent than Sfaradim, but even Sfaradim, the Rav Vadia in uh, uh, writes, and also in Yakut Yosef, by Rabbi Tzchak Yosef writes that uh, even if someone is not going to eat directly off of the counter uh, and they're going to cover it, it's still a good idea to uh, spill uh, to pour uh, uh, boiling water on the uh, counter or clean it but if you're going to cover it uh with a uh you know with tinfoil there's not uh, as much of an obligation but it's still good uh, good to do 
Um, but again, remember, for Sfaradim, they're more, you know, they're, they're not as stringent as Ashkenazim in that particular regard. Okay. Not proper research. Okay. Uh, why? Why limitations to pay before the iron in chapter two to four? I would have to look into it. It would take too much time. Uh, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Uh, I'm sure that there is a commentary over there. Just look at Rashi over there, or uh, Balbanel, or Ramban. Uh, I'm sure that they uh, discuss it over there. Uh, can someone who has not yet, when it comes to language and specific letters, unless it's something that you studied before, it's not something that you typically have off the top of your head. Uh, it's something you usually have to look into the sources and then read them and so on, but it takes too much, too much time. Uh, can someone who has not yet completed the conversion celebrate Pesach? Uh, I mean, every, if a person is in the process of conversion, meaning that they are uh, you know, in the process of moving, or they have already moved uh, to a Jewish community, they're observing uh, the mitzvot 99%, you know, they're observing 99% of Shabbat, they're observing a uh, kosher all the time, they're modest, and so on, and they want to uh, uh, celebrate Pesach uh, on their own. There's no problem with their family, no problem uh, for them to do it. It's uh, practice. It's not a mitzvah for them to do it. Uh, they're not going to get a reward for it, but it's certainly a uh, good practice for something that they're going to do in the future. Uh, so sure, they should do that. Uh, generally speaking, it takes more than a year for people to convert. Uh, some people, it takes them many years, uh, depending. But So during that time, while the person is going through the process of conversion, they have to live as if they're Jewish already, meaning they have to fulfill the mitzvot in order for them to, be, to uh, get familiar with the mitzvot. So... Pesach is certainly one of the one of the things that they have to celebrate uh, as as part of that process. Sure. Um, question for bedridden sick person who lives alone, except for a nurse or aide who's a gentile. What are the obligations of Pesach regarding the first two nights sedo? Uh, as far as them uh, being bedridden and sick, it all depends on how what that actually means because some people are sick and bedridden. And, but they have first-class service where whatever they want, uh, they can get. Uh, or they have uh, you know, a certain family of friends that uh, can pick them up or come over there. Uh, but if you're talking about somebody that's literally bedridden, they cannot move out of the bed. They don't have anybody that can help them. They don't have anybody that knows anything about Judaism. They don't have anything. Then obviously they simply could do the best they can. The best they can is to... Uh, try to read the Megillah if it's possible for them and to eat matzah on the first two nights. That's the main thing. Uh, tell themselves the stories of the, uh, of the Exodus for as long as they can uh, and each person to the best of his ability. If, it, if the best of his ability is to do this for five minutes, then that's it. Five minutes is enough. If he could do it for five hours, do it for five hours. It all depends on each condition. Knowing, uh, you know, uh, myself, you know, as far as how difficult it is to be uh, sick and how difficult it is to function when you're sick. I can, you know, I can relate to this very well. That it's a uh, you cannot compare one sick person to another. You can't compare one pain to another. Uh, so uh, bedridden to one person means something different to another person. Some people they have a little headache, they stay in bed for two days watching TV. Other people. Literally, they, uh, they have uh, broken limbs and, uh, you know, they're, they're barely able to uh, think straight, but they're still functioning in the world and doing everything they need to do. Uh, you know, so bedrid doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's too broad and it all depends on a person. But generally speaking, a, a person needs to do the best they can to fulfill as many of the mitzvot of Pesach as they can. Uh, the biggest thing is to eat matzah, on uh, the sedel, obviously not to eat non-kosher, uh, not to eat non-kosher for Pesach, not to eat chametz. Uh, those are the biggest thing. If they can do more than that, by all means, do more than that. And Mr. Uh, Shem will give them refuah shlema. What does Rav think about individuals or organizations that create or sell Noahide Sidur books? Would it be permitted or would it be wrong? Thank you so much. Uh, none of G'dolei Israel 
uh, were behind this uh, this idea. I know that the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe uh, was very uh, uh, proud advocate of the Noahide movement, but really the, uh, the the whole thing was has changed since he died, almost thirty years ago, uh, and the Noahide movement uh, that's under. Uh, the auspices of Chabad is really just an extension of Chabad because in their books and in their uh, websites and everything, they're constantly bringing everybody to the Rebbe, the Rebbe is Mashiach. So in so many words, all of these Noahides that left Christianity and the idolatry of Jesus are now replacing it with the idolatry of the Rebbe. So this is obviously not a healthy thing uh, and certainly should not be done and forbidden to be done. Uh, as far as a Noahide Sidul, you're not going to find uh, a permission uh, in any Allahic book that says that uh, Noahides should be provided with a Allahic book, uh, with a uh, Sidur and a structured prayer, because the Noahides are supposed to pray uh, from their heart, whatever they wish, not to have a structured prayer book. If they write one for themselves, they can, but to give them a structure like that, that's not uh, something that you're going to find any of G'dolei Israel doing. Uh, that's number two. Number three, uh, it's very problematic, according to many opinions of the Chachamim, uh, to spend uh, the, uh, you know, the time actually teaching Noahides in general, like to exclude them and just have a course uh, and a, uh, a teachings only for Noahides is problematic. It's, Jews are not supposed to do that. Now, I can teach now, and I have many students that are Noahides, but I'm not excluding myself to Noahides. It's just simply part of my teaching. If a Noahide wants to show up, by all means, they can show up, they can listen. But to, uh, to have a program only for Noahides is problematic. Why? Because our obligation is to Jews. And you actually have... Uh, certain Chachamim like Rav Ovadia, Rav Oyrbach, uh, um, uh, a, a, uh, um, uh, well, there's a couple of other Chachamim that were very, very much against it. Very, very much against it. Uh, so uh, for them to have entire organizations just to cater to the Noahides, and to sell them all these products that none of G'dolei Israel supported and even permitted, uh, obviously that's not the way of Judaism. This is the reason why it's never been done before. Noahides have always existed. You know, it's even in the Torah. It talks about Noahides. It talks about righteous Gentiles. Noahides is not a new thing. So how come throughout the last 3,334 years that we have the Torah, that we have the great sages, that we have much greater sages that preceded us than ones that exist now, how come you're never going to find a single sage, a single Chacham, a single Rishon, a single Tana, a single Amora, a single great extraordinary Rav even, from any part of Judaism, ever write a book that structured the prayers of the, of the Noahides? Not a single time. Why? What? What? The only, this wisdom only came to the year 2000? No. It's because it's not allowed. You're not supposed to do it. They're, they're not supposed to pray for Masidu. This is not, this is not, this is not a, uh, a mitzvah for them to do so. And in fact, it's a, uh, it's a very big problem. It's a very, very big problem. Why? Because it, as I've said in other uh, shulim, other lectures, that it is making a, uh, a mini-Judaism. You know, it's, it's making the Noahides start acting, feeling, behaving, and living as if they're Jews without the conversion. And although that seems good, it's actually not good. Or else it would have been done before. Why is it not good? Because if they want to be Jews, then let them convert. But if you're going to teach them that they can, in essence, get all of the benefits of Judaism, all the holidays, all the prayers, all the different teachings, without the conversion, why should they convert? So in so many words, you're holding back conversion. And I can tell you that there is a story in the, uh, 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 in the Torah, in the Tanakh, about uh, Elisha. Elisha, the Talmud of Eliyahu Navi, Elisha Navi. He had a servant named Gehazi. Gehazi was a Jew. Gehazi was a, knew a lot of Torah. He used to teach Torah even. 
But Gehazi, Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin says, Gehazi has no share of the world to come. He has no share of the world to come. He's in Gehenom, he's never coming out. Why? He slowed down conversion. He got in the way of conversion. So, when people do things that are not in line with what the sages have taught us for the last several thousand years, automatically, you should assume it's wrong. You should assume it's wrong. If anything that anyone tells you is not based on the Torah of yesteryear, there's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with it. Why? Because there's nothing new under the sun. If writing books specifically, you know, by rabbis to Noahites, by rabbis to the Noahide community, writing them a Sidur, writing them, a, I don't know, certain types of books just to teach them. If that was a good idea, don't you think that the Ramban would have done it? He was surrounded by Noahides. Don't you think that the Ramban would have done it? He was surrounded by Noahides. Don't you think that the leaders of Hasidut that preceded the Lubavitcher Rebbe would have done it? They were surrounded by them. Don't you think that the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself would have done it? He was surrounded by it. He was even a pro-Noahide movement. But he never said to write books. He never said to do all this stuff that people are doing now in his name. Don't you think that any of the sages that literally lived among the, 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 the Gentiles, associated with them, even befriended some of them, never wrote a single book, never wrote a single sidu for the Noahides. Why? Why? Why did this idea just appear now? It's sort of like this other guy that Baruch Hashem is no longer in the picture who brought this idea uh, to the public pretending like he knows more than everybody else and he told people that Gentiles not only are allowed but they should observe the Shabbat and he had a whole little uh, thing over it and he taught people yeah yeah just the people are wrong telling Gentiles they're not allowed to keep Shabbat that's incorrect they don't know what they're talking about meaning the Rambam doesn't know what he's talking about according to him the Rishonim, the Achonim, nobody knows what he's talking about until this little Momo came to the year 2020 and that's him and another guy another uh, 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 rabbi were preaching were traveling from place to place wrote a few books I think something called the Gare or something like that uh, and uh, teaching everybody oh yeah the Noahides, they uh they uh they should keep Shabbat. Guess what? They were wrong then, they're wrong now, and eventually Hashem uprooted it, uprooted them from teaching Torah. The, the the one guy that was the most obnoxious one, the younger one, he uh not only left the world of teaching Torah in, uh, in such a capacity, I think he went and started working for some moving company, like you know, it's a, a, I don't know, he invested a lot of time exercising, lost a lot of weight, and then he became like a mover. Like, I mean, it's, with all due respect to everybody that's in the moving business, to go from being a so-called rabbi and a leader of the new world, uh, telling people that he knows more than the Rambam, to being a mover, that's a pretty big punishment. He may not even realize he's being punished, but that's a pretty big punishment. That's pretty embarrassing. But there's no problem of embarrassing him. Why? He went against the Torah. Megale panim ba Torah. He went against the Torah. He said that uh, he could do something new. So all of those people that are teaching the Noahides exclusively, that and they are rabbis, they're Jewish rabbis, are teaching the Noahides exclusively, are writing books for Noahides exclusively, are, are, you'll notice that they're not just doing that, uh, and teaching Jews, you'll notice that they're only focusing on the Noahides. And you're not going to find that as part of the Jewish tradition, as part of the uh, Masoret. So, this is not something that any of Gdolei Israel ever did before, which by itself is a sign, an indication, and a clarification that this is forbidden. Uh, and in fact, if you go to the Abiyah Omer by Rav Ovadia, he says it's outright forbidden. Uh, if you go to some of the other Chachamim out, and he brings sources, I don't know, maybe uh, 150 sources, 100 sources of why it's forbidden. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a question uh, for anyone that knows a little bit of Torah. It's only a question for the public that, generally speaking, doesn't know much Torah. Uh, and uh, so again, if you're teaching and the Noahide shows up, no problem. No problem, they could show up, they could listen to Musar lectures, it's not a problem. But 
to go and make an entire uh, organization just for Noahides and you're a Jewish rabbi, not allowed. Why? Your brother comes first. Your brother comes first. So what's the motive? Why would they do it? Why wouldn't these so-called rabbis cater to their own brothers, the Jewish people? Because they're not after people. They're after money. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Money is a priority to them over their brothers. Now, I didn't always think this way. I used to think that teach whoever wants to be taught. Not necessarily prioritize over one or the other. And teach whoever wants to be taught. And one time I had, this is maybe eight years ago, um, a test came up. What was the test? Somebody invited me. I think it was in Orlando or Tampa or I don't know, something uh, five hours away or something. Here in Florida, but it was a long way. Invited me to come do some Noahide event and they were going to bring, I don't know, like a lot of people. I don't know, I think it was like a thousand or two thousand people. Or an extraordinary amount of people. And on top of it, they were willing to pay me. At the time, I didn't even have money to, to, to pay rent. Uh, so money was certainly in need. Uh, this was after the crisis and everything else. And uh, they're willing to pay me. On top of it, they're telling me there's going to be no less than 500 people per event, but the bigger event is going to have even more. Uh, and well, what I'm doing is I had, at that time, I used to have a shiur once a week I, uh, on Tuesday. And the average shiur would have, I don't know, maybe like 8 to 12 guys coming. You know, eventually it got a little bit bigger, but it never got to 500 people or 1,000 people. And so now somebody's telling me, 500 people, 1,000 people, 2,000 people, all these great numbers. Oh, fantastic. This reminds me of Wall Street when I was there. The big, you know, big crowds. Yeah, yeah, that's more like it. Yeah, come teach us about the seven Noahide laws. Oh, great, seven Noahide laws. Fantastic. It's Torah. It's great. Yeah, sure. And money and the people and all. Fantastic. All right, I'll, I'll get back to you. I have to ask my rabbi, but uh, this sounds good. Okay, call Rabbi Ephraim. Hey, uh, Rabbi Ephraim, yeah, yeah, great news. I have these people, they're inviting me to, I don't know, some hole in the wall, Tampa or Orlando or some place in the world. There's going to be a lot of people. They're going to do this, they're going to do that, and uh, teach them Torah. What do you think? It's good? Good? Get, get on the plane? Not allowed. No, no, no. Not understanding. No, it's not Christians that, that want me to teach them about Yeshua or something like that. No, no, no. What I'm saying, I'm going to teach them Torah. I'm going to teach them, uh, you know, no hide laws and all types of wonderful things and Musa and this and that. And it's 500 people and they're going to pay me like $25,000. Not allowed. No, let me try to explain. No, no, you don't have to explain. Not allowed. Why? Is there at least one Jew that you can teach during that time that you're going to that place? I said, yeah, it's probably more than one Jew. Probably eight or 10 or 12 or 15. He says, therefore, you're obligated to them. Do you know what kind of test that was? I don't have my, I, I just had my first kid. I don't have money to eat. I'm just starting in this whole gig of teaching. Finally, I get some crowd. Finally, I get some attention. Finally, I get a whole huge thing that's more similar to my previous life of Wall Street. And I get not allowed. Why? Because there's like eight people in the neighborhood that I have to convince them to come to my house to learn that I'm obligated to. Now that's a test. But Baruch Hashem, I passed it. Why? Because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to listen to the rabbis. Listen to your rabbi. Listen to your rabbi's rabbi. All the way to Moshe Rabbeinu. Therefore, anytime you see people go off the tradition, you should know they are going in the wrong direction because tradition is something we already have. We don't make new ones. We don't make new ones. We have, that, we have it already for the last few thousand years. Nothing new. And anyone that goes off of it, they're destined for destruction. Them and anyone that follows them. And unfortunately, even though there may be some good people involved, behind it, good intentions, the road to hell is also full of good intentions. That's just the way it is. But if you look at Allah, you look at... Uh, what Chachamim have done. Everything that you see in the world today is something that it's, that, that's kosher, that's, that's, that's 
It's something that's based on previous teachings. Even uh, Zohar Kadosh, for example. Zohar Kadosh from a couple thousand years ago. Most people think the Zohar Kadosh was like a new invention. No. Zohar Kadosh is based on over 60 books. I think it's 64 books that were written before it. He's quoting it in the Zohar. Every book that's ever written is based on something else before it. But you're not going to find the Noahide books quote the previous generation's Noahide books. Why? Because Chachamim didn't spend any time writing them. Now, are there Chachamim that discussed Noahides? Absolutely. Are there Chachamim that even had uh, books written all about Noahides? Yes, but they were not catering to the Noahides. They were catering to the Jews that deal with Noahides. Even Rabbi Tzach Yosef has a segment of his Yalkut Yosef that deals with Noahides. And there's no problem for a Jew to read it. It's written for them. But to go and write a book and have a whole organization just catering to Noahides, this is nothing similar to any of the things you'll find in previous generations. And quite frankly, according to many Chachamim, which Rav Vadya on top of them of its most recent big psak, he writes in Nebiya Omer, it's forbidden 100%. Forbidden with absolute terms. No, no like uh, leniency whatsoever there. So hopefully that gives you guys the answer. Uh, next question. If someone bought a glass or a metal vessel a while ago and doesn't remember whether or not he kashered it, given a doubt he has, should he immerse the vessel with or without a bracha? Uh, the best thing to do is to bring something else that you know for sure that needs a bracha. Uh, you know, go buy yourself something else and uh, and make the bracha on that thing and, uh, and it will absolve both of them. That way you eliminate any doubt and any risk of b'chala or risk of not blessing when you're supposed to bless. Um, we hear a lot about occult systems and gestures such as the eye in the pyramid, devil horn hand, okay, okay, okay. Now what's the question? Long, long question. Try to get to the point, please. It's part of a cult war, as you mentioned in Torah. So what does it say? Should we avoid these kind of things? Can they be dangerous for us? Rather than avoiding them, is it better to just ignore them completely? Okay. Anything connected to witchcraft, uh, the, uh, the signs and things like that, that's not part of the Jewish tradition, has to be avoided because many times it is connected to uh, idolatry, witchcraft, and all types of things that are forbidden, uh, according to the Torah. Uh, so uh, it's uh, not just something that uh, a person should uh, uh, stay away from, uh, you know, uh, passively, but actively stay away from it. Meaning that if you see it, simply walk away from it, walk away from those people, and uh, quite frankly, don't even befriend them. If you have friends that are involved in witchcraft and the like, uh, you should end the relationship because they are dangerous people. Uh, as I go with my daily Torah study, some simple interpretation that doesn't necessarily go against the sages pop into my head. Should I treat these like venom and discard them uh, automatically lest I end up like Manus and Meza? Uh, unless you can double check your uh, understandings with a Talmit Chacham, uh, then uh, no, there's no reason for you to... Uh, um, to uh, take them into account. You should focus on uh, what the sages say. You're allowed to have your own ideas, especially if those ideas don't uh, uh, contradict the sages. But, um, you know, it's again, you have to know a lot in order to know that you're not contradicting the sages because what the sages said is not just what's in front of you. Sometimes you could see one thing that's not contradicting this particular sage that's in front of you, but it could be contradicting a different sage outside. So... Uh, as far as a chidush, anytime you have a chidush, if you're going to, uh, you know, write it, publish it, or something like that, it's always good to uh, double check with a talmid chacham. Uh, there's no, there's no problem of having insights and chidushim. It's just that you have to be careful with them. Uh, if someone in the conversion process is still living with parents, how should they prepare for Pesach correctly when chametz is still in the house? Uh, well, the uh, they have to have their own room where nothing is uh, chametz in there and do the seder or whatever they're doing over there. 
uh, where they themselves are not eating chametz. They themselves don't have chametz in their room. They themselves are, uh, in essence, have a little uh, uh, division within the house. Thank you for the blessing, uh, Chaim. Is the Israeli flag a Jewish symbol, and is it okay to hang one in a Jewish home? Is it a Jewish symbol? No, it's not a Jewish symbol. Uh, the uh, you're not going to find the Magen David uh, symbol in the Torah. Uh, although there are some Chachamim that say that you could uh, see all Hebrew letters within the Magen David. Still, you're not going to find a Torah source that's going to discuss the. Uh, Israeli flag or the Magen David in it uh, and, and many don't think it has anything to do with Judaism altogether it's not even the Magen of King David <coughs> but still needless to say it's the symbol of the uh, uh, the, the uh, Jews have uh, uh, related to or many part of the Jewish people have related to uh, in recent history uh, so you know the person shouldn't necessarily desecrate it or burn it or anything like that but to, to, to make that flag as if it's presenting Judaism? No. What presents Judaism is Torah. Torah presents Judaism. Now, is a person allowed to have an Israeli flag on their home? Sure. You have a flag of Israeli flag. There's no problem with having an Israeli flag. Um, but uh, just make sure your next door neighbor is not a Neture uh, Karta, because they may burn your house. <laughs> I'm kidding about that, but not really kidding. They may burn your house. They're more likely to... Uh, damage your house than even a uh, an Arab would. Uh, they, they hate Israel <laughs> more than Arabs. Uh, what is the job from, what, what, and if the, okay, your questions are going far. Can you explain the contents of Toldot Yeshu uh, about Paulus and Petrus? I have a uh, shiur about it. I discuss these things, so there's no point of, re of repeating it. Uh, if you go to my uh, page, you, you type in uh, Yeshu or Yeshua, Christianity, you'll have several uh, uh, lectures there. Uh, there's also a playlist uh, on the page called Noahide Playlist. Part of them is also teaching it against there. And I discussed this thing also. Uh, it's extensive. That's why I'm trying to skip it. Um... What if from job, from job, whether, huh? what if from job, whether if it's not conversion yet, in which observing Shabbat would like to do since my job is flexible, still I would like to prove them. What should I do? I've done the bi-weekly. Okay, from what I'm understanding that you're saying is that you uh, have a job, you want to convert one day, and you have a job, and your job is allowing you to observe Shabbat only once every two weeks. Uh, so if you're serious about conversion, then uh, you'll have to uh, observe Shabbat, again, 99% every week, not once every two weeks. Uh, and you'll have to observe all the mitzvot every day, not, not, not sometimes. The more serious a person is about conversion, the more they have to start living like that now. If a person is not serious about conversion, uh, it's better off for them not to do anything. Just to be a righteous Noahide and focus on being a Noahide, and that's it. Can't see. I have to change my name if it's possible when I'm economically from... Uh, yeah, you definitely, if you want to convert to Judaism, you definitely have to change your name. I mean, you don't have to necessarily just change your name legally. You can just change your name, you know, publicly. Uh, you know, it's a... Uh, it's not, you know, you can just call yourself whatever you want to call yourself and change your profiles on the internet and other places. And it starts that way. And eventually, you know, change your name uh, legally. Okay, so the same person is asking about uh, the one that wants to convert but lives with their parents still. Uh, and I told them to exclude a part of their house. They're asking, so would cleaning the whole house be for nothing if I'm doing the sedum in my room and everything? Uh, I mean, it would be a cleaner house. <laughs> I'm sure your, your, your parents would like that. But, 
if, if your parents are not observing the holiday because they're not Jewish, I don't see a point of cleaning the whole house if they're going to continue eating non-kosher food there, other than making them happy that you're cleaning the house. But you know, for as far as a mitzvah or anything like that, it's not a mitzvah for, for, for the sake of the seder. Okay, let's see if we have a couple more questions here on TikTok. There we go. Okay, I have a question. Here we go. What if my parents hold we can eat kithniot, but we eat by my grandparents who forbid it? Well, if you're eating by your grandparents who forbid it, then they're probably not going to feed you kithniot over there since they're the ones that are cooking. Uh, and therefore, you can, you know, you can eat it during the holiday, uh, but not during the uh, the nights of the holiday where you're in the sedo. And you certainly should not bring it to their house if they say to forbid it. You shouldn't bring your customs to somebody else's house. If you're hosting somebody else uh, and you have your customs, you don't have to change your customs for somebody else. But if somebody else is hosting you, then uh, you cannot ask them to change their custom and it certainly would not be appropriate for you to bring your customs to them. My father brings kitniot to the meal regardless of respect or not. Uh, your father should learn some musar and, there, you know, and therefore he'll learn how to behave. It's not appropriate what he's doing. Uh, let's see. Oh, nice. Well, somebody asked you what we talked about. You repeated almost everything we said. Talk about very good. What does the Torah say about Hiulim? Hiulim are thoughts. The Gemara Masechet Yoma says Avera Kashim Avera. The uh, thoughts of sin are worse than the sin. If anyone watched the uh, movie we made called Tikuna Brit, we had over 10 million views on that movie in the different languages and channels. And in there, one of the uh, main things that we build on is Hiulim Avera. The Gemara Masechet Yoma. Uh, that uh, the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin. Why are the thoughts of sin worse than the sin? Because the sin itself of immorality, if let's say somebody is, you know, pogema uh, brit on his own, or he's immoral with somebody else, that's limited. There's a limited amount that a person can physically do these sins. But the ulim, the thoughts of sin, it's unlimited. Unlimited sins. A person can think about, uh, you know, bad things all the time. And in essence, makes sense. Now, why is this even worse? Because the um, Rabbi Chaim Yivolozhin says that when a Jew thinks of things that are against Hashem, like idol worship or immorality, uh, that is worse than what Titus did to the Bet HaMikdash when he desecrated it. Why? Because while Titus did what he did in a horrible way and desecrated the Bet HaMikdash, that was a place in this, you know, the Shekhinah already left. That was a place that's in this world. Whereas the mind of a Jew, that is like the Cheder Yichud, the one-on-one -on -one room between that Jew and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So when a person thinks of idol worship or immorality, things that are forbidden, that means that the only one that knows about this filth, about this sin, about this betrayal, about this, you know, lie and, and, and garbage, is Hashem. Meaning that it's a person doing the worst possible thing in front of the one uh, uh, entity that, uh, you know, that, that, that is affected by it. So this is like, you know, a, a person not only betraying their wife, but betraying their wife right in front of them. Right in front of them. And only in front of them. Nobody else sees. But he's doing it right in front of them. So this is the worst possible thing. And that's what Rabbi Chaim Yivolozhin says, is the reason why the Gemara in Masechet Yoma says, the thoughts of sin are worse than a sin. Because the thoughts of sin, the only one that knows that you're sinning is Hashem, which is in essence, makes it worse. Because at least when, let's say, for example, 
a uh, the Torah says why is the punishment of somebody that uh, steals during the night worse than the punishment and somebody that steals during the day why it's Torah says if he uh, the Torah says the punishment for somebody that steals during the uh, night is worse than the day because the one that stole during the uh, uh, night uh, the one that, that stole I'm sorry the one that stole uh, during uh, during the night he's afraid of what people are gonna say so therefore he's afraid of anyone seeing him anyone seeing him doesn't care that Hashem sees him he just cares if people see him that's the guy that's stealing during the day he doesn't care about Hashem he doesn't care about people so Hashem says at least that's even at least you know he's putting me in the same caliber as people he doesn't care what I say he doesn't care what people say he's just stealing during the day he's making a sin during the day but the guy that's stealing at night he only doesn't care about God that's it he, you know that that's 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 the thing so it's it's an insult to God and that's the, the reason why he gets a bigger sin so the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin for that reason as well because it's only God that knows that you're sinning What kind of obligations do we retain and have to the secular nations? Ah, obligation that we have to the secular nations. We have an obligation to serve Hashem. Part of serving Hashem is learning Torah, doing mitzvot. If the Jews fulfill the Torah and the mitzvot, that means that they are going to be a light to the nations. Now, being a light to the nations does not mean that you go out and, you know, to the, to the rest of the nations and, uh, you know, and, and look to build things for them and look to cater to them. No, simple. By the Jews following the, the laws of the Torah, by the Jews doing everything that they're supposed to do, that by default will make them be better to the nations, which means that if we are going to do business with the nations, we're going to treat them fairly. If those nations are benefiting us, like for example, uh, you know, America has been hosting more Jews than anybody else in the world uh, for the last 70 years or so. So for a Jew that's going to do business in America, for example, they have to take that into account. In fact, some Chachamim say that you're forbidden from charging Gentiles interest if those Gentiles are hosting you in their country and they're good to you. So anyone that's in the lending business that's a jew he is violating the the, the rules of the torah why because you're showing lack of gratitude to your host country needless to say this means that we also have to be uh, uh fair and honest and uh, uh not just to jewish people but also to the nations but uh again it's a uh it's important for a person to know that by following the torah the Torah itself will make you a light to the nations. You don't have to actively uh, chase the nations in order to bring them like and project light on them. Simply put, following the Torah is going to make you good whenever the nations do, uh, uh, do come and uh, need your help in, in any way. It changed my life today. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for learning with us. Thank you very much for learning Torah. Thank you very much for doing mitzvot. There's many other lectures online that a uh, person can uh, watch on the uh, channel, on the app. We also have an app called Be'ezot Hashem. And also anyone that wants to, uh, uh, wants to join our WhatsApp group to get updates and uh, daily clips. There's short clips that we put there every day and uh, different things. You can join our WhatsApp. Just send me a message either to WhatsApp uh, 1917 468 2324. Uh, or you could just uh, message me privately wherever you are Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, I don't know, wherever Hashem, the people are watching it. And that's it, guys. That's it. I think we uh, we covered all the questions that you guys had today. Oh, here we go. Last question. Last question, I think. Oh. Facebook just threw me a few more questions. Since this is the last year I'm going to do it until after the holiday, I'm going to push myself a little further. I still have actually another two shiurim, but 
uh, that's t tonight, tomorrow. Um, let's see. Any tips for davening without the mind getting distracted? Uh, yeah, if a person wants to daven and focus, then look at the words. Look at the words of the Sidu and say them with your mouth. Look at the words, say them with your mouth, and try to think about the meaning of what you're saying. Your mind cannot think about two things at once. If you're thinking about the meaning of what you're saying, uh, then you're not going to be thinking about work and, and everything else that uh, is constantly goes into your mind. Um, how do I know what would, what would, could, or can't be considered chametz? For example, would perfumes, lotions, skin care uh, products, soap uh, be considered chametz? How would you know? It's a very good question. I posted on my WhatsApp uh, earlier this week or last week a uh, list that was recently published by, uh, we, we publicize it as well, like in their name, of the CRC, the Kashrut body in Chicago and all over the U.S., of different things that need Kashrut, different things that don't need Kashrut. Uh, so uh, if you join the uh, WhatsApp group or send me a message in some way, I'll send you the list. That's one. Uh, two, you can go to the CRC Kashrut website, and they have it over there. It's like 170 pages, but it has all different types of useful material. Three, there is a video on my page, uh, YouTube page and otherwise, that we did last year about the laws of Pesach in a short format. Like I think it's maybe like, I don't know, an hour or less, the whole shoe. It's not a long shoe, or maybe even like 15 minutes. I don't remember exactly how long it is, but it's short. Uh, about Pesach. It discusses some of these things. So the combination of the video and that list certainly could help and answer all the questions that you have. Uh, and again, anyone that joins the WhatsApp groups will uh, also get this. Uh, so tomorrow also, I'll, I'll send this list again to everybody on WhatsApp. Uh, and also there's another um, list that was by the Yalkut Yosef that I published on the uh, WhatsApp uh, that is uh, telling you which uh, pots uh, and parts of your of your uh, house need uh, to be kashered, which don't, and how to kasher them. In so many words, all the things you need to know for Pesach, we have available. Just contact us. The best way to contact me is WhatsApp. That's just because it's in front of me all day. The other stuff is not usually in front of me. I'm... People sometimes get offended that I don't respond to the messages. It's not anything personal. It's just that I get too many messages. But I, I try to answer everybody at some point. Sometimes it takes me two minutes. Sometimes it takes me two weeks. But I try to answer everybody. Oh, our dear Chaim just published uh, the link on Facebook. Uh, if somebody could do that, same thing on the other networks. Uh, and anyway, if you send me a message, I'll send you the uh, links and all the attachments and all that good stuff. Uh... What is the name of God? Uh, the name of God is, uh, we call him Hashem because that means the name. Because the name is a uh, too holy for us to say. He has multiple ways that he refers to himself in the Holy Torah. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is the uh, ways that are in the Torah. But you're not allowed to just say them just, just because you're not allowed to say them. Usually people that are uh, clueless idol worshippers uh, like to pronounce the pronunciate the four letter name, uh, you know. But it's forbidden to do that. Forbidden to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for learning with me. Shem bless each and every single one of you. Please next week enjoy the Pesach holiday. Prepare for it. Enjoy it. No fighting during the seder, no matter what. It's a time to get connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's a time that, you know, you can use some of these teachings when somebody asks you, why do we even do these sacrifices? Now you know. Now you know the sacrifices are very much as relevant to today as they are to, uh, they were to a few thousand years ago. And uh, plenty of more. After the holidays, Bezal Hashem, we'll get back to learning again together. Enjoy the holiday. Enjoy the family. Enjoy the break. Enjoy learning Torah. Learn as much Torah as possible. And uh, Bezal Hashem, we'll learn again soon. Call to Bachabas Tacha. And anyone that um, also uh, knows Hebrew will be having a Hebrew shiur later on tonight. So that's going to be online tomorrow as well. Call to Bachabas Tacha. Chak Sameach, everybody.